It is 6.02 p.m. on Tuesday, January 3rd. I'm gonna to call to order this regular meeting of the Winooski City Council. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance led by Deputy Mayor Jim Duncan. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Agenda review, any changes to tonight's agenda? Okay. Uh, public comment. We don't have anyone in the room. Uh, I do see one member of the public attending on Zoom. Um, if you wish to speak about anything that's in tonight's agenda, if you can wait until we reach that, um, please do. If you're here for to comment on something that's not in tonight's agenda, please use the chat or the raise hand feature to let us know. Okay. Seeing no public comment, we will move to the consent agenda. We have our council and liquor control board minutes from December 12th, the accounts payable warrant from December 29th, payroll warrants from November and December, and the legislative priorities that we saw at our last meeting. Um, I do believe there is a, a correction to be made to the minutes. Yes, so I'd like to uh, make a correction to con uh, consent agenda item A. Um, there is an address uh, correction that needs to be made. Um, it references 72 West Spring Street. It should be corrected to 72 East Allen Street. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments on consent agenda items? Um, yes, okay. And Thomas, you weren't here for those that meeting. I was so. not. We'll pull that one out separately. So for item A, um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes with the correction as um, Bryn stated. So moved. Second. Motion by Bryn, second by Aurora. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those abstaining? Thomas. <laughs> um, okay, so then if there are no questions about items B, C, and D, do I have a motion to approve those? So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Bryn. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. You can vote on that one, Thomas. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm coughing. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. We are on council reports. Aurora, can I start with you? Certainly. All right. So there haven't, I don't believe, yeah, there haven't been any meetings between when we last had a council meeting. However, next week, um, we have a special meeting on January 12th at 6 p.m. of the Inclusion and Belonging Commission. And on Janu January 10th, uh, we have a regular meeting of the Safe, Healthy, Connected People. And what we had reviewed previously was just the budget presentation that Ray had presented to council. So we'll have our regular meeting on January 10th at 6.30. Those are the main items I have. Thank you. Uh, the Infrastructure Commission um, held a meeting on December 15th, but we did not have enough commissioners to hold the quorum, unfortunately. Um, we did have a number, uh, a good handful of uh, residents that were interested in some of the agenda items on. Um, uh, up for discussion that evening. Uh, in particular, the uh, ordinance changes proposed to incentivize historic preservation. So we had at least um, two additional community members and then um, a member of the planning commission attend that meeting um, to just review the uh, those items with the infrastructure commissioners that were present. Um, so there was um, ample interest as you know we've seen um, vocalized in the community um, uh, about preserving our historic buildings, spaces and places, and um, the, the additional opportunities to protect those spaces um, beyond what uh, is included in the ordinance. Um, again, there was, it was just discussion. The thing was um, put up for recommendation or further pursuit at the time. Um, because we have struggled to meet um, quorum since the um, off and on since the start of the fiscal year in July, 
uh, we actually don't have a, a work plan that's been approved yet. So um, we've had joint two joint meetings with the finance committee um, in October and November, and that took precedence over work plan. And then we didn't have a quorum in December. Um, we are hoping to have a review of um, officer roles um, for January at our January 19th meeting. Um, where the chair uh, has decided that uh, he has too much on his plate and needs to kind of step back, um, but wants to stay involved. So um, that's coming up again, January 19th. Um, another item of interest to everyone is the uh, VTrans is holding a public hearing on January 12th about the double diamond interchange that is in person or online. It has been noticed um, already uh, through our city channels and through Front Porch Forum, but um, please keep a, a lookout for additional uh, reminder notices coming up as well. Thank you. Well, only one update. I joined um, Burlington Mayor Weinberger in hosting a an event with our state reps and senators, sharing some of the priorities from the legislative priorities that we just approved that we have been speaking out over the last um, couple months. And tomorrow I will distribute that further to committee chairs once those are set in the legislature. Jim. Um, only report, just a reminder that we have an off-cycle housing commission meeting this month on January 9th, on January 19th from 6 to 9. So um, we haven't met since, but we'll be meeting them for a longer meeting to dig into uh, housing quality and maybe potentially some charter change language. That reminded me that planning commission meets on January 12th, um, having further discussions about incentives, parking, historic preservation. Uh, Thomas. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to thank um, downtown Winooski and everybody who donated either financially or their time to assist in getting the holiday tree and the rotary all lit up. I'm looking really uh, pretty for everybody to enjoy. It was definitely a large effort <clears throat> that just regular residents for the most part, excuse me, um, undertook. Um, so really just a big thank you to everybody who's involved in that. Thank you. All right, um, Elaine, city updates. Thank you. City updates for January 3rd, 2023. As you know, we're continuing the fiscal year 2024 budget meetings tonight. Community members are encouraged to be engaged in the process. To see the full budget and meeting schedule, please visit winooskivt.gov slash FY24. If you have questions, please contact us at 655-6410 or budget at winooskivt.gov or just get in touch with me or your counselors directly. A many thanks to the public works and public safety teams over the holiday break for their work to keep our streets and sidewalks safe during the winter weather events. Remember, you can sign up for overnight parking ban alerts by texting Winooski to 888-777 or by visiting winooskivt.gov slash parking. Also, many thanks to our partners at Green Mountain Partner for their tremendous efforts getting our neighbor's power back on across the state. If you need COVID-19 test kits, they are available for free at City Hall, the library, and the Senior Center during regular hours. If you're interested in running for local office on town meeting day, which is March 7th, 2022, uh, 2023, the following terms are up for for election. Winooski City Councilor to your term. There's two of those. So two city councilor um, to your term seats are available. Uh, Winooski School District Treasurer. And when I say available, it means you can run for those. Winooski School District Treasurer, one of those, uh, three-year term. And two Winooski School District Trustee seats. One is a three-year term and the other is a two-year term. Residents must file a consent of candidate form and petition with a minimum of 30 signatures, more are encouraged, by 5 p.m. on January 30th, 2023. Forms can also be obtained at the city clerk's office. Visit the city clerk's office at 27 West Allen Street or winooskivt.gov vote to get your consent of candidate form and petition sheets. 
You can file your form and petition at the city clerk's office, again, at 27 West Allen Street, Monday through Friday, 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. If you have questions, feel free to call or email the city clerk's office at 655-6410 or clerk at winooskivt.gov. And finally, uh, there is that January 12th exit 16 double diamond interchange public meeting that uh, Councillor um, Oakleaf just mentioned by VTrans, the Vermont Agency of Transportation. You can also um, attend the city council meeting on January 9th for their presentation on this project uh, to Winooski City Council and any members of the public who wish to attend that meeting. That's all for me. All right, thank you. So we're moving into our regular items. Up first for discussion is the FY24 budget presentation for public works and capital improvement plan. Do we have, John, there you are. And I should say for members of the public that we do um, invite public comment during each of these agenda items. So I'll prompt you when we get there. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, Happy New Year, sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Can you all see that okay? Yes. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Good. So this will be the public works installment of the- Annabelle, uh, do you want to minimize? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, John. Yep. Um, so this will be the public works installment of the FY24 budget. Um, so we'll be covering the um, what we've been up to in FY23 and what we're going to be focusing on in FY24. And then we'll jump into some of the budget discussion. So this covers the annual public works operational budget, as well as the general fund capital plan budget and that that does include all uh general fund departments so general fund as you all know but maybe for the public um any property tax revenue type department so public safety fire um planning community service those those different departments and then um we we'll, we'll get into the enterprise funds so that's the water fund sewer fund and um I'll touch on the parking fund capital budget and then just kind of wrap up with some emerging issues that might have budget implications down the road and I'll um I'll pause at the end of each of these sections if you have questions or just jump in if if you have a question on something So FY23, our current year, so these are the items sort of above day-to-day uh, -day, uh, public works operations that, that we're up to. Most the council, I think you're all pretty familiar with these, but I'll just give a quick update on the two um, major infrastructure projects, the Main Street and Winooski Bridge project. So as you know, in 2018, we, we have a $23 million bond vote approval for Main Street. Uh, to reconstruct that entire corridor. We're, I, I think I've said this before, but we are finally at the finish line for this project. So the main task we've been working on is gathering all of the easements that are required along the corridor. So we need a total of 63 easements from each of the property owners. Uh, we are only in need of seven and they're really just one owner at this point and we're pretty confident we're we're going to have those. So once we have all those easements in hand, we can go out to bid um, and, and get some pricing on what this project will be to construct. So um, I expect um, probably next meeting, your next, well, maybe not the ninth meeting, but in January, or early February, we're going to be coming to you with a proposal for construction bid services and um, um, there might be some other agreements that we may have to, to request to move this project out to bid. So we're getting close. We're getting the project out to bid and, um, you know, hopefully we'll get some decent pricing for this. The other project that you're aware of is the Winooski River Bridge replacement. So back in August, we received $24.8 in federal funds to replace the existing uh, Winooski River Bridge. 
So VTrans is leading this project with our um, with our partner Burlington, who owns the other owns half of the bridge. So we've, you know, to date we've really just been working on getting a uh, an owners rep on board, uh, which is um, a design professional to get that process started. So there's not a lot to talk about at this point, but um, we've had some interviews with consultants and. Um, I believe VTrans right now is is putting offers out to the the recommended consultant that the team has has chosen. So, um, just a reminder on schedule for that one. So, the main I think one of the big challenges for this project is that we have to be under contract with a with a contractor by September thirtieth, twenty twenty seven. It sounds like it's a long ways away, but in a big project like this, that'll come up pretty quick. So um, these projects will will move into the next slide when we talk about FY24 focus. And then I just want to highlight the other items um, that are called out CCRPC supported. So that's our Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. So we have a lot of um, grant supported initiatives that we're working on with them that uh, we've started on, but they, they will also continue into FY24. So moving into FY24, looks pretty similar, um, mainly because these are some big projects we're working on. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a few years, but uh, the scope will be hopefully much different. So Main Street, as mentioned, will be um, in construction, assuming we get some decent bids. And then the Winooski River bridge replacement will now be on the drawing board. So the other project that um, could be in construction is the lot 70 uh, city owned parking garage. So that's another one. So we could see some pretty heavy construction this this coming summer uh, in the F FY24 uh, budget season. Um, and that also includes the VTrans Exit 16 project that we were just talking about. Um, that they'll be coming to the next meeting, as as Elaine mentioned. To VTrans will be giving an update on that project. So, um, before I get into the so some of the budget discussion, does anyone have any questions on kind of the the highlights from this year and focus on next year? I have a question. Um, on the previous slide, the wastewater treatment facility 20 year evaluation, uh, who conducts that evaluation? So that is a requirement of our um, our updated NIPTES permit for the plant. So that was that's being that's in progress by Aldrich and Elliot, a consultant we typically use for our wastewater. Um, we should be getting a report, a draft report back next week on that actually okay and uh so uh, and then one below it phase two stormwater system investigation is that a permit requirement no that one's not a permit requirement it's um <clears throat> we've done an initial phase one and that that is that's one of the grant funded projects that rpc is helping us out with it's video inspecting um, all of our stormwater lines to get a sense of what condition they're in and, and to prioritize uh, replacement work or lining work um, or some point repairs. So that's more of just um, good housekeeping type project. Um, uh, we, we get, it's an 80%, it's paid for 80% by C CCRPC and then it's a 20% cost to us. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Okay, no more questions. Moving on. <laughs> moving on. So getting into some of the budget discussions. So for FY24, um, we are not proposing any changes in staffing. So here's a picture of our latest. This is a pretty recent crew. So this is like half the size this summer. So we <laughs> we've been doing some work and thanks to human resources for, for helping us out. But we are um as of last week fully staffed up, which is amazing. We didn't think we would be there by this winter. Um, so for FY24, no changes in staffing. Um, this is our organization chart. We do split it into kind of two main categories of 
we call it our street crew and our, our water resources crew. Um, granted, they all work together. It's a pretty small team, but for budgeting purposes and, you know, for who's doing what scope, uh, that's our breakout. So for the street crew on the left side, um, we, we have six equipment operators, um, one mechanic and one deputy director. And then on the water resources side, on that right side, um, we have two wastewater treatment operators. That's the EO3s that are listed there. And then two distribution equipment operators. So they're, those are the staff that go out and maintain the, the sewer lines and the water lines and, and uh, exercise hydrants and clean catch basins, that kind of work. Uh, and then they're overseen by the utility manager. And then of course, um, the city engineer and myself are kind of split in between those two groups as we kind of touch on both of those. So this is our, our current work chart. We're not really looking to, as I mentioned, add any staff or change anything for FY24. Um, getting into the operation operational budget. Um, so level services, and then I would also just you know, really say that these are, this is what our recommended minimums would be for um, operational cost. Um, so this is, these annual operational budgets are, include all the facility costs. So, you know, our utilities and maintenance for all the facilities, um, all the street costs, the annual street costs. So sidewalk repairs, trees, tree trimming, um, lighting repair, grounds. And then of course, um, the salaries and benefits for staffing. This is just a, a slide to kind of show you where um, Public Works lives in the overall budget. So the bar graph in red shows the Public Works budget over the last um, five years. So we were pretty consistently around 1.2 million. Um, this year, as you'll see, we are a bit higher. We're 6.87% higher than the FY23 budget. Um, but yeah, we, we're typically in between sort of community services and general administration in the, the full general fund budget picture. John, if you can pause there just a second. Yep. Um, what percent, what portion of that um, increase is attributed to um, being fully staffed? Um, there, we budget for fully staffed either way. So FY23 is the budgeted fully staffed. I see. And, yeah. Got it. Not the actual. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And you can kind of see on this next slide. So our year to date FY23 and projected oh. is, is, well, the salary benefits line is a bit lower, um, or FY23, not significantly, but it's kind of, it's pictured in the actuals. So this is just an overview of the roll-up sheet that you get in the budget book of our public works budget. And it kind of compares the, um, the last few fiscal years. So just to give you um, an overview of where some of these increases are. So it's um, salaries and benefits is probably the main increase for FY24. So that's mainly due to um, just our union contract requirements. And then going down that budget increase in that, that box or the bolted points. So there is a, we did budget for a 12K increase for road salt. That's not quantity. That's just the contractual rate for the same amount of road salt we typically use in the year. Um, and then we did increase the budget by eight, eight grand for uh, contract road painting. So we've, as you've probably seen, we have some catch up work to do out there. Um, a lot of it was caused by not being able, being able to get materials during sort of the, during COVID. And so now we have some additional painting work to do. Um, this doesn't include the uh, 58,000 that we currently have contracted with um, uh, a line painting contractor that they're going to be doing in the spring. So this is in addition to that. So there'll be some additional crosswalks um, and parking stalls and the typical line painting work. Um, we, uh, we've also increased the tree budget by about six grand. Um, that's mainly because of 
what we're seeing in actual work that we've spent um, over the years. So it's not, you know, that's just get us right sized for what we're actually spending. So we're not just going over that budget. Thomas has a question. Thanks, Christine. Um, John, at a previous meeting a few months ago, we had discussed um, potentially using a new type of paint that was more expensive but would last longer. Does this budget include using that paint or the paint that you're currently using now? Yeah, it would it would include it would include using the more durable paint. So if we're going to have a contractor do it, we would have them use the um, it's either an epoxy or a poly polyurea paint versus the waterborne paint that it lasts less than a season. It's 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 not very useful. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. That's really good to know. Yeah, and I, I will call out, we've got one little revenue line that's kind of over on the left-hand side. So we do collect right-of-way permits. Um, those are curb cuts, driveways. Anytime a developer comes in, um, that's usually 25 grand. That's our one little revenue contribution that, that's kind of just public works here. Um, just to show it sort of another way, this is just a, a, the breakdown of the different categories of that budget. So as you can see, most of, most of our public works budget is in that salary and benefits line. Um, and then the next highest is the materials and equipment, which is 21%. Um, so this includes things like road salt. Um, we spend about $77,000 a year in road salt. Um, maybe not this year, <laughs> depending on how this weather keeps going, but that's probably the biggest uh, materials item in that that bucket, um, but it also includes like building maintenance and road materials and um, vehicle maintenance. So, uh, John, if, yep. Um, just on the road salt question uh, topic, um, do you know if all municipalities in the state are reliant on road road salt for treating surfaces, or if there's an alternative um, substance use? Yeah, for the most part, everyone uses road salt. There are some liquid applications, which is, I mean, they, it's a brine, so it's um, it's just salt and water. It's like a twenty two percent solution. We're looking at that because that could save us, um, save us some salt usage. Um, it's it's really effective when we have weather like this where it's kind of rainy and instead of going out and laying down like road salt and it bouncing all over and then it raining and going down the catch basin, we could put down this 22% this solution. And if it's lost, then it's not as bad. So that's one option. I, I have heard people say they use molasses or some other kind of funky materials, but um, that hasn't caught on yet. <laughs> to, yeah, I, uh, as as I know. that's, that was, Part of what was in my um, the thought that I had in my head was uh, for protection of um, stormwater and uh, surface water, um, mitigating use of salt um, is is something that's utilized out in um, like Western Washington, the Seattle area. Um, so I was curious about any cost expenses um, or recommendations from the Department of Environmental Conservation about um, type of treatments that are preferable for um, environmental protection, but um, may be um, cost beneficial for our interests. Yeah, we are we are actually exploring that right now. So the um, Chittenden County, there's a Clean Water Advisory Committee that we sit on, um, and I've reached out to some of the folks there about, um, potentially looking at brine um, application because they're what we're trying to find this might be getting too much in the weeds but yes <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it there we are we are exploring some options okay great thank you yep um before I move on to capital are there any additional questions on the public works operational budget no thanks John, no, never mind. This is for capital. Never mind. Okay. All right. Moving on. So capital budget. Um, so I guess first, what is the capital budget? Um, I know you all are very well aware, but just, I guess, for the public, um, 
this is criteria that's set up in our financial policies. The capital plan is a five-year look ahead um, for replacing our major assets and 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 performing projects. So, and then what is a capital asset? That's covered in these thresholds here. So it has to have a useful life of three or more years and then meet these uh, financial thresholds that's in our financial policies. So for FY24, we have um, right now a revenue of about 1.05 million for capital. Um, as you can kind of see in those in this table, some of those items are dedicated reserves for Main Street and the Myers Pool. So um, that third column, the 458,000, that was dedicated uh, capital funding to support those two initiatives. Um, part of that's local option tax revenue, and part of it was the um, a percentage of the rate increase in FY19. So. Um, yeah, I will say prior to FY19, our capital uh, fund was just those two first rows. So come a long way. And then, um, you know, we've we've sort of discussed using the uh, maximum 50% of the TIF funding to support the Main Street project as well. So that might hit in FY26, potentially, if the once the debt comes into play for Main Street. John, on, just, yep. just before you move on to debt service, um, I know that there has been some review of, um, well, let me let me start um, back a little bit further. So it, in May, June, when the council reviewed um, strategic priorities, um, council voted on some of uh, the preferred priorities for FY23. And um, consideration of uh, the environmental components of the master plan were um, towards the top of those priorities for council. Um, and I don't see anything for capital improvements included, uh, you know, uh, that are proposed for FY24. Can you speak to that? Um, say that again, the environmental, are you talking like energy efficiency? So the or? master plan um, yep. pulls out um, for the infrastructure side of things, various um, energy focused and environmentally focused efforts. Um, you know, you mentioned that there's some additional funding for um, the tree committee and for um, some elements that, that are in the master plan for that. Um, is there any funding allocated for other um, energy related benefits uh, or improvements called out in the master plan? Yeah, I would say there's probably not a specific capital project, but there's elements of existing capital projects. So for example, um, just say the Main Street project. So there's significant stormwater uh, improvements in, in that, that corridor design um, that we will have to do. So we have gravel wetlands that will be incorporated into that project versus what's out there now, where it's just stormwater running off in the catch basins, which go directly into the Winooski River. Um, that lighting will be converted to um, more efficient LED lighting. Um, so I, I don't think there's a specific energy or environmental project, more of components of existing projects or, right. yeah. Okay, so that's that's new, those are new lighting. What about existing lighting? The only other lighting that we own is in the downtown. Those have all been um, recently re-retrofitted with LEDs. So that would that's the only other lighting that we own currently, the street lighting. Okay, so not the parking garage? That is all LED lighting as well. Um, I think that was updated and Angel may have to help me with this one, but it it's it's not at its useful life yet no it's it's definitely within the first 10 years of its its useful life okay. i've heard some things differently um but i can connect with you separately on that okay great um yeah moving on to the sort of the the expense side so 
in general, for FY24, it's sort of business as usual um, for capital. There's no major projects that we're budging for in FY24 or um, you know new assets. Uh, for FY24, we have some vehicle replacements and uh, annual street resurfacing. So on the expense side, we, we really have two categories of expenses. So there's this, the debt service. So that's anything that's uh, financed. It's usually a major cost that we want to kind of um, pay off over multiple years. And then there's the one-time capital expenses, which is usually uh, the annual street resurfacing mainly or small vehicle replacements. So for FY24, um, we have existing $590,709 of existing debt payment that year. So roughly it's a little over half um, of our revenue is just right there, um, is just existing debt we're paying off. And what we're proposing for FY24 for new debt is um, uh, a replacement of an existing uh, 2012 small dump truck. So an F550 dump truck that's that's scheduled for replacement. So that's a $82,000 <clears> piece of equipment. So that is something that we would want to try to break out over. Um, we would we would do a, what's called a lease and do it over four years so that we have some capacity left in our capital budget to do some other replacement work or, or fleet replacement. So that's the only item we're proposing for debt service in FY24. Um, and that would bring the debt service up for FY24 to $612,809. John, I have two questions. Yep. Does this include in the future year, maybe Angela too, uh, the the fire truck is that baked into the future year fleet costs? Yeah, it is in in the budget book. You'll see a really detailed breakdown of all of the items. Um, and it's not necessarily it's in the fleet for debt service, not in the fleet expenses. Okay. And then, did you say this also incorporates the annual pavement resurfacing? That will be on the next the next okay. slide. That's an annual cost. Yeah. The only street resurfacing <clears throat> that you're going to see on this page is anything that's major reconstruction or historical debt service. Um, I think in 2012, we repaved maybe a dozen streets using long-term debt. Thanks. Yeah, so this on the ex capital expense side, so this is the one-time cost, no financing. This is where we typically do the annual street resurfacing work um, because we're doing it every year and wouldn't make sense to, to, to finance that over uh, multiple years for you know one project. So uh, for capital expenses, we have the usual annual street resurfacing, which I'll I'll get into more detail in the next couple of slides on that. And then um, we do have two fleet replacements. One is um, annual PD cruiser replacement. And then the other one is a small 2013 tractor that we're replacing. You, you'll see it buzzing around the downtown this time of year, cleaning up the pavers. Um, so that's, that's really it for expenses. And then the total, Again, with the majority of that being annual street resurfacing is about 392,000. Um, one note, um, I, you know, subtracting out what the existing debt and the proposed debt in that last slide, um, we have about 305,000 left, um, but we do have some, some reserve funding and because we had some savings this year in paving that will cover that uh, additional amount. So we've got to just update the the budget book that you all have um, with that updated amount. Um, actually, before I go on to paving, any other questions on some of the capital expenses? There is a pretty detailed, I, I didn't include it in this, this presentation, but there is a pretty detailed um, 
line by line um, for each category. So for example, like parks, um, that park line, if you go to the budget book, it'll include a line for each of the parks in Minuski. Transportation includes paving, street resurfacing, sidewalks, um, all those items. So there's a little bit, there's more detail in there. John, I just wanted to ask if the 297 for annual street resurfacing, this is still too low, right? Like you've been recommending a higher number to actually keep up with all of our streets. Yeah, for, so for example, FY23, we did a review of um, what we should be spending. So Winooski, we have 15.6 miles of what we call class two, class three streets. So those are streets we're responsible for. They're not the main corridors. Typically, you want to resurface those um, every 10 to 20 years. So assume you're doing a mile, or we should be doing a mile a year. Um, last year, that would have been about 300000 that we should have spent based on the asphalt prices. So that's the other factors. Asphalt prices go up and down. So last year was a high one. Um, and we spent 130,000. Um, but some of that was we had to adjust, just throw another caveat, we had to adjust our paving program because the work that we we're trying to do was much higher than, was much more than we could afford that year. So, but yes, looking, and we looked at over the last five years and we, um, I can send you that graph separately on what we should have, what we should be spending for that year. And we were always, pretty significantly under budget for what we should be spending. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, to, to talk about paving a little bit more. So the, these are the streets we're targeting for next, next summer. So these are, um, it's over in the Myers Pool land area. <clears throat> so it's Audette Street, Pine Street, Shepherd and Hall. Um, <clears throat> they're in pretty poor shape. So that's why the, the number is much higher than, you know, we've, we've typically done is they're, you know, if, if you're looking at a condition of a street and you're looking at from say zero to a hundred, zero being worse, hundred being best, these are in like the 10 to 20 range. <laughs> they're, they're in really poor shape. So that requires us to do a little bit more work than the typical resurfacing, um, and you'll see that sort of on the next slide. Um, the other thing I'll just call out here is we have been we have been um, improving the network overall. So if you look at the it's called a weighted PCI. So PCI is a pavement condition index. Um, it uses that scale from zero to a hundred. We try to inventory the the street network every two years with. CCRPC interns. Um, they were unfortunately tied up last year, um, but we are going to try to get them back in town uh, this summer to do another inventory of the roads. Um, in 2016, we we're at a 72, which was great, um, but then it it dipped down to 66 in 2018. So I don't know if there was some, there could have been that crop of interns may have not, um, I don't know, may, may have overestimated the conditions of the roads in 2016. Um, but, it, you know, we, we did go out and evaluate as well, and they were probably around that 66 um, mark. But we, <clears throat> we also have done work like Hickok Street and some, we've kind of bolstered the paving program a bit and we're we're trying to work it back up to a 72 that's that's our goal is for the class twos and threes the the streets that we're responsible for is keep them at that 72 level and that's um that's considered uh like that's considered satisfactory for the network and then this is our entire street network um right now and it shows um, our proposed paving work over the next five years so you can see um, for simplicity colors green is green is good um, red and purple is 
very poor. So you can kind of see for the targeted scope in FY24, uh, a lot of red and purple streets over there. And then we do like to try to bounce between the east side and west side of Winooski. Um, So one year we'll do east side, next side we'll do the west side. So uh, for FY25, we're proposing to do some streets over on the east side um, and then kind of going back up to like the um, Pine Grove area up there, Crescent Ave up that way. Um, one issue that we're we're trying to figure out is um, so in FY twenty three, if you remember, we did target the streets over on the the far east side, uh, Florida Ave, Gal, Bernard that are shown, uh, they're outlined yellow over there. But what we found out was that the the curbing really needs to be replaced over there as well. So that adds significant cost to the project. Um, the curbing work alone for all of those streets was around four hundred thousand um, dollars, and we have you know we budget around I think two hundred grand for just paving work. So we're still trying to figure out how to fund that project, whether it be um, chasing some grants um, through VTrans. Um, but that is some work that we're going to have to to do uh, eventually. Um, we are also trying to do the sidewalks uh, in that that area as well. The sidewalks are in very poor condition, um, so that is um, something we'll have to discuss with you all uh, down the road. And then just uh, <clears throat> one of the the important things we look at with these streets is um, you can see this this deterioration curve. So streets are a little different than like say sidewalks and other infrastructure. They they don't have a linear deterioration. Um, it's much cheaper to, to, um, to repair them when they're in kind of satisfactory condition before they really deteriorate. So what you're seeing in that curve is you want to resurface those streets before they really start hitting that downslope and it costs much more to resurface them. And then you're doing like, you know, you're getting into full reconstruction projects once the road gets um, really bad. So that's that's sort of the game we have to play is try to catch these roads before they get, you know, too far off. And then it costs us a lot more to um, to do that work. So that's that's sort of the takeaway here. Um, that's all I have on the capital side. Um, I'll pause again if if you all have any questions. Also open it to public comment too. If you're sending via Zoom, use the chat or raise hand feature. If you have any questions, but council, go ahead. Um, John, about the um, the roads that need curbing and with the expense associated with that, given the proximity um, to you know, surface waters within our jurisdiction is, is there any potential for stormwater grants or funding? Yeah, there, there really isn't too much. I mean, there's, you know, we did um, some bioretention basins like in Pine Grove Terrace, um, but that it's only a small portion of curbing. So it may help a, a, a small bit, but, um, you know, I think we'd only do a couple of those bump outs, um, two or three, uh, for, for one of those streets, but yeah, it's a good thought. Like that's, that's where we're trying to come up with right now is curbing is such a, a expensive piece of this. And we're trying to tie it to the sidewalks because we have to get the curbing in to really accommodate the the sidewalk installation because th there basically is no curbing on a lot of these streets on this side of town like these three three or four streets in particular so we have to get the curbing in so we can put the sidewalk at the correct elevation so that's that's what we're trying to angle at uh for grants i saw andrew i saw your hand was up and it went down yeah paul can you bring him over please go for it hey everybody how's it going my name's Andrew. I live on Pine Grove Terrace, and I just happened to notice uh, the nice bright red for my street. It's just, does that mean that will get done in um, 2024? Uh, Andrew, unfortunately, no. <laughs> your your street is identified like that whole 
quadrant is identified for resurfacing, but right now we have it targeted in FY26. My, I can read that correctly. So um, yeah, unfortunately it's a couple of years out. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, a couple of my community members and neighbors have been talking about it, so I'll let them know that's what what's on the books. Thanks. It's in the queue at least. Any other questions? Okay. Great. All right, moving on to the enterprise funds. So starting with the water funds, um, similar to op the general, the public works operations, this is really kind of the minimum that we should be spending. So this is, this budget is for operation maintenance of our distribution water system. So that's our pipes, hydrants, valves, those things. Um, the main cost for this budget is, is actually buying water. So we buy our water from, our potable water from Champlain Water District. That is um, right around 52% of this entire budget. Um, and we do have a capital budget with this fund. It includes things like water main replacements and um, you'll see the water tower allocations. Um, and then any fleet replacements. So for FY24, we are proposing a pretty large increase. Um, the rate it, we're proposing is $52.02. So that's $8.04 over FY23 or 18% increase. Um, for reference, for a, an estimated three bedroom household usage, um, that 2,200 cubic feet is per quarter. That's about $5, six bucks a month additional to that household or um, $18 per quarter, per billing quarter. John, what what is the percent increase of the Champlain Water District rate? Uh, I can't remember offhand. Um, it went up more than we were expecting though. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to un understand what is under an 18% increase for this fund. Yeah, I'll, I can go through that for you. Okay. Yep. So here is, um, here's a comparison budget. So for, we're about $117,000 above the FY23 budget, um, $86,000 of that is the Champlain Water District rate increase. So it's not only rate increase, it's it's um, the amount that we're using. So we, we look at historically how much um, usage we have over the over the years and then so that that changes as well. Um, so it, it is eighty six thousand dollars of this this increase of the 117,000. And there, then yeah, their rate increase for us um, going into FY24 is going to be nine and a half percent. Yeah. And then the other piece of this increase, which is about $34,000, is the contract salaries and benefits um, for those staff. And then the remainder is, is the cost of the increased cost of materials, uh, mainly, you know, 2% increases for a lot of the, the materials that we're using. And I'll show that. So this is, again, just an overview of categorically what that budget looks like, 52%. So 81% of this budget is, is water purchase and um, our salary and benefits cost. So that's where the majority of it is. Um. I'm trying to wrap my head around this. The amount of water is costing more because of a nine and a half percent rate increase, but then you're buying more volume. But like in in theory, the customer rate would only be impacted by that by nine and a half percent because you, if I'm using more water, I'm just paying for more water, not like a higher rate on top of more water. We've also not been budgeting any sort of capital budget other than existing debt service for the water fund for several years now. I thought we got both water and wastewater tracking towards this year being in a healthy position. 
where we were rebuilding that reserve and we could do like a more incremental rate increase. And then there was a nine and a half percent CWD rate increase on top of us being able to build in that incremental increase to, to establish a capital plan again. I guess we're, we're looking at an 18% increase for users. Only half of that is CWD's rates. And so the other half you're saying is to back the, is inflation and then building capital reserves? Well, we're not, we're not actually adding, we're not building any capital reserves. This is just a balanced budget to pay for the existing capital. So there's no, there's no money going to um, additional capital reserves. It's just paying off existing capital debt in this, in this budget. So we are balanced at least. So it's paying in this, you'll see in this chart, it's paying for that 83474 of existing debt, but there's no new capital proposed in FY24. Okay, that does not align with my recollection, but I will follow up on that. Yeah, and I'm happy. I'll send along the, the detail info um, that might be helpful. John, staying on this uh, a little bit longer. Um, what water conservation efforts has the city pursued? Um, internally or just in general, like both. Um, internally, we we haven't pursued any that I'm aware of. Besides, when we replace equipment, it's always going to be, you know, a, a higher efficiency piece of equipment. Um, we also have been doing leak detection program to try and mitigate loss in system. We do a loss in system calculation every quarter to make sure that we're billing all the water that CWD is invoicing us for. Yeah, thanks, Angela. We we do partner with USDA Rural Waters. Um, they they came to town this year to do a pretty uh, a citywide inventory of leak detection. Um, I will say talking with some of the developers, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the new form-based code type buildings, those are typically low flow fixtures that are in those new new buildings. Um, so that isn't is that one benefit. But isn't that part of energy code requirements? Yep. Yeah. So it's not necessarily any efforts that the city is pursuing. Correct. Um so it, it it feels uh, reactive um, to, uh, it just feels like a reactive um, mechanism to you know, move forward, but upgrade only as needed rather than being proactive saying, where can we find efficiencies? Where can we implement reductions so that we're saving the amount of water, saving on the amount of water purchased and the costs related to it. just an observation. Can I ask this Elaine question? has, sorry. <laughs> Elaine, go ahead. I'm just thinking if I understand you correctly, Brenda, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. we can. So it, it seems to me that most of this reduction would have to come from residents. And so at least for this year, we wouldn't be able to budget for that because we couldn't predict uh, what how much they could conserve water. John, is that accurate that most of the reduction in use would have to come from residential customers or, or customers rather, rather than yeah, the interventions? There's pretty limited usage on the city side. I mean, we're, we're mainly office space. Um, the treatment plant really doesn't use much in the way of water service. So it's it's yeah it's mainly on the residential side and any any savings that we have on what we're buying for the water we're also going to take the hit on the revenue side because we do pay ourselves for water as well um it would be great to put numbers to the purchase what percent goes um is attributed to the city what percent is uh attributed to uh, co uh customers non non city users yep yeah that's easy to do but if i understand this i mean we're 
changing the volume only matters if you then can cut a position because you have enough less demand to necessitate fewer people running the system. To the point that was made originally, like if you buy a thousand gallons <clears throat> or you buy two thousand gallons, the rate stays the same. The only change that we can't change the purchase price from CWD. The only thing we can change is I understand it's a big cost driver here is the salaries and benefits, which is people. So whatever efficiency we could realize would have to result in fewer people working in the waterfront. Am I missing something here? Uh, to me, it doesn't seem a volume question. It's a it's a cost to deliver the whole system question. Am I wrong? I think you're right, unless the I city has a big water mill. Yeah. Right, and so that was a question. And it would just be the, so if there's a municipal use that could yeah. cut a position, then we could. And and city usage would still impact the revenues of this budget. Right. Yeah, if we could cut city service enough to eliminate a position, or city use enough to eliminate a position, then we could see a change in the water rate. But otherwise, we still have to pay the same rate. We're just paying less and getting less. Yeah. Yeah. So to and me, it I seems like unless there's, a, unless there's a step function where we can get rid of a person, which I'm not suggesting, but I think that's the only way to change this formula. There's not very many people who work for this department. In fact, no person 100% comes out of this department. It's only increments of people. I think we have the equivalent of, I think it's like 2.7 people working in this department. Aurora, I'm sorry, you had a question. Um, I was just wondering the tiny little gray sliver. I noticed that one isn't labeled. Is that utilities and fuel or it's training? training? Okay. Yeah, I think I think that's a training one. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Great. I will. Oh, sorry, Thomas. Saw your hand up. No worries. Um, I am guessing we're past the point of negotiating that increase with CWD. That's not something that we can negotiate. They set that increase for the entire county, um, and that memo's already come out. All right. Thank you. So I'll, I'll move on to the capital side of this. So for the water funds um, in FY24, we have an annual um, cost of 83,474. Um, that is mainly the make is made up of those bulleted items under existing capital debt. So uh, the water tower supply allocation that we have um, up on water tower Hill in Colchester, we pay a portion of that space. Um, West Canal Street reconstruction work, water main, and then the, uh, the recently completed Hickok Street water main replacement. And then we are um, we are right now estimating that the Main Street project will add an additional 53,744, um, potentially in FY25 when that project, um, assuming that project wraps up then annually for um, I believe the term on that the term on that one's for forty years with USDA. And then just the last water fund slide. So I do want to highlight this. Um, you know, one of the things to think about when I nobody likes to raise water rates, but this is something that will be we'll we'll have to look at more seriously, um, or not more seriously, but like. It's going to require some real money. Um, our water system is mainly made up of pre-1929 original cast iron water mains. Um, and those are all coming to the end of their useful life. So we're we're starting to get to that position where we really need to um, look at replacing water mains as part of street work and resurfacing. So we did start that with Hickok Street. That's number, this list, uh, this priority list is in our uh, water distribution master plan that was done back in 2016. So these are the priority water mains that were identified. This is based on 
uh, a bunch of criteria. They did hydrant flow tests to see what, you know, what, how much friction is in the pipe, which gives an indication of the age and, and looked at as built drawing. So there's, there's a few criteria that are, that are baked into this list, but these are the top 13 um, that are recommended replacements. So uh, I, I moved this number, uh, the estimate up in 2021, that's obviously much bigger now. So we're around 15 million in um, future needed water main repair work. So in the improvements category, it shows short-term, that's, um, zero to 10 years, those should be done. And then long-term is within the next, within 10 to 20 years uh, of June, 2016. So this is something that's in the back of my mind at trying to get, trying to build some capacity in our water fund so that we can start doing some of this work when um, we have we have the ability and the timing's right and we have some grant funding. Thomas. You might have already answered my question, John. I was just going to ask if we pursue the EPA drinking water grant to get this type of work done. We typically will pursue the state revolving loan funds. Um, there's usually a, a a grant involved with that, but um, it's it's difficult because it's not these aren't projects that we're just going to do one off. It's usually tied to like a full street reconstruction project. So that's why Hickok Street, even though it's number three on the list, we did it because the street was in in poor shape and the sewer needed to work. But um, La Fountain Street is one we're we're slowly pursuing right now because um, that street will probably need to be resurfaced in the next you know, five to 10 years. Um, so we're starting to do some work on that and we'll we'll keep an eye out for grants like that, the EPA grant when when the timing's right. Right. John, how, um, what's the re recommended frequency for these um, master plan updates to be reviewed? Yeah, I think we're, we're probably gonna pursue it next year because there's been a couple changes in the, the distribution network that we may want to remodel it. Um, so for example, Hickox Street, we upsize the pipe. Um, Main Street, if we redo that, we may want to do some hydrant flow tests again. So I would I suspect in the next one to two years we'll we'll be updating this again. And is there any incorporation of system conditions outside of this assessment that helps uh, shift the priority. Um, say that again. The, so if there are any operation and maintenance issues outside of the assessment, outside of the master plan update, does that take, is that taken into consideration in the order that you, that's listed here? Yeah. Yeah. So for example, Platt street, we've had a, quite a few breaks on that street, even though it's not shown on this list, um, that is a priority for us, um, that, that's just not shown here. And when we do the updates, that will probably Platt Street will jump onto this list. I was I suspect pretty high up, just because the number of breaks that we've seen um, there in the last since 2016. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, anything else on the water funds before going to the sewer fund? No. Okay. All right. Moving on. Sewer fund. So similar to water funds, um, difference here is we own the treatment plant. So we <laughs> we are we're not buying water like on the water side. So that's that's an aerial view of our wastewater treatment plant. Um, so this this fund does include sanitary sewer uh, distribution and maintenance, storm sewer distribution and maintenance, uh, and the wastewater treatment plant operations. Um, similar, we are looking at a, a, a larger increase this year to $63.46. Um, that's 10.6% increase over FY23. Again, what that means for the average three bedroom household is about a $5 increase per month or a $13 increase per billing quarter. 
And again, this is the comparison for FY23 versus FY24. So you'll see here, it's about a $43,000 increase from the FY23 budget. Um, that's primarily due to salary and benefit increases. And um, you'll see the, I believe it's the, um, yeah, the, the specialty supplies line. So that's chemical costs for the treatment plant. Um, that rate has gone up. There is a decrease on the contract side because we aren't proposing any, um, any professional service work in FY24 at this point. Um, no UPWP projects or anything like that. So that um, we were able to lower that contract to line item. And then again, this is just kind of the overview. Um, again, most of it is uh, salaries and benefits. Um, the BTV biosolids, so biosolids, um, that is sort of the leftover solids from the treatment plant operations that we have to truck that to Burlington, they dewater it, and then it gets landfilled. So that is a pretty significant cost that, that we pay for $155,000. $156,000 annually. So that's a um, big chunk of this, this pie here. So for the sewer fund, we are proposing um, some capital expenses this year. So we, so similar to water funds, we've been really holding back, trying to incrementally increase rates, but we're at the point now where we've held back a lot of those capital projects and they just, they have to get done. Um, so those are listed here. So for FY24, what we're proposing are two treatment plant projects. So one is we have a controller on our disinfection system. It, it's in need of repair. Um, the quote for that's 25,000. And then the roof over the administrative building that, that houses all the, um, the controls for, for the entire facility. Um, that roof is in need of replacement. Um, so that's 45 grand. And then we have a, a pickup truck that's really on its last legs. It's a 2009, um, just regular pickup. So those are the three capital projects that we are proposing. And then as shown, we currently have about $167,000 in existing annual debt this year uh, for those items shown. And then again, Main Street, um, that's going to be a uh, you know, a pretty large chunk of debt that would come on in FY25, 193,000. So um, that's what we're looking at uh, on the sewer fund side. Before I move on, any questions on sewer fund? No. All right. Last but not least. Uh, parking fund. So this one's pretty easy and short. So parking fund capital plan only. Uh, it includes on street, Cascades garage, future Abenaki garage. Um, no on street capital this year for FY20 or no on, no on street capital for FY24, which is usually meters, um, the parking kiosks. And then Ab Abenaki garage, proposed Abenaki garage. We haven't been including that because it's been um, we haven't had any progress on it for the last couple of years. So we're like, we're not going to include it in, in this year's budget. But as you know, we, we've had some progress, um, but until we actually start seeing some costs and have some budget, um, we're not going to bake that into the budget yet. So for Cascade Garage, the only thing we're proposing is the annual structural maintenance work that's $130,000. Um, that is just the annual structural work that we do to, to maintain the decking and the concrete. And we have a, a contractor that comes in the season before and identifies where um, we need to address some issues. So that's, that's where that number comes from. Um, these, these numbers, um, are a bit outdated, um, but this is what we have in roughly, it's it's lower now, but 
Um, that's what we had in CIP reserves for those specific items. I do want to call out the, so these, this is the one capital budget we've been, I, that's, I think has been budgeted really well. And we've, we've had some reserves for when things break down, but unfortunately the, this is the funding that's, that's going to get spent down to subsidize the Abenaki garage potentially based on um, the modeling that you all saw. So that is that is something that we we have some concerns about if there is an emergency in that garage in the cascade garage that you know if we have an MEP issue like an HVAC system break something that's unscheduled um, we might not have the funding we might not have the funds available pending what comes back from the RFP um, for the the finances for the Abenaki garage to address something that happens. So I just, I want you to be aware that that, that is a concern that, that we have on our end. So that's, any questions on the parking fund? I have a question. Yeah. Um, what happens if, so, in, in here, you're saying there is no proposed budget um, for the Abenaki, Abenaki garage for FY24. What happens if there's momentum and that would warrant uh, a need for funding in FY24, but we haven't budgeted for it? Um, so because this is not a budget that is voted on by the community at large, we can come to the council at a later time to adopt a budget once this starts to break ground and we have an idea of when it will be operational. Um, it may not be ready for operations until fiscal year 25. Okay. Um, John, did you... Uh, Slide 32, um, I don't know if that was the last previous slide that you Oh, on. yes. I think there was a typo in that, the presentation you had. It wasn't, I think it referenced like FY22. Yep. Values, yep, yep. So was that I'm just- Sorry about that. A holdover that should have been deleted? Cross it out, yep. All right, almost at the end. So emerging issues, um, I think you all know most of these and we've talked about them. Main Street construction, exit 16 project, um, a lot of disruption on the Main Street corridor that we'll have to um, work through. Uh, some ongoing capital needs, you know, with the paving that we talked about, the, the Winooski Burlington Bridge work, um, water mains. Um, one thing I didn't mention during the water discussion is there is some additional regulatory requirements that we're, we're having to work through. Um, like on the water side, we have to do a lead uh, service inventory. So we're, you know, it's uh, something we have to, I don't think it's going to be a cost per se, but it's just resource um, time to, to put that together. And then as mentioned, just the Abnaki garage and the parking fund. So with that, um, yeah, I just want to say thanks for the time um, talking about infrastructure and thanks for the, the leadership team and all their support. Thanks to Elaine um, and especially thanks to the, to, to my management staff. So Ryan and Joe and John for just being, um, having great, knowledge and leadership skills and really appreciate them. And of course the staff, like, hey, I, I do presentations and spreadsheets, but the guys on the streets are the ones that really make things happen and keep the city operating. So a lot of, a lot of respect for them. Thank you, John. Um, are there any, any last questions from members of the public? Okay. Um, I would echo your sentiments to your team and thank you for spending quite a bit of time with us on this. Um, with that, I am gonna call a five minute recess. It's 7.22 on my clock. So we will reconvene at 7.27.
We are back back in the meeting. Um, before moving on to item B, a couple of follow-ups for item A. Um, Jim and I, thank you, Jim, I'll see you, was able to find notes from previous budget years. And the situation with water and wastewater was that we were tapping into reserves for operations. And so we had stabilized to not doing that anymore, not funding capital. So that aligns with what um, staff just shared. Thank you for helping with that. Um, I also just wanted to make space for, Elaine has asked us if there are scenarios or things we wanna see for our January 17th budget discussion, that we take votes on that. So I just wanna take a, a pause here and see if there's anything anyone wants to bring up. Um, I, I not um, just trying to go back to the agenda real quick um, and to the previous presentation. Um, I do have concerns about underfunding um, some operational needs for like we don't we don't have any funding for traffic coming right now, um, and just knowing that we're there are already a number of complaints that come in. We don't have a good mechanism for tracking those right now. Um, but even if we did, we don't have a, mecha a mechanism to respond to those requests. Um, so I, I'd like to see a proposal for the 17th have some type of line item that includes um, funding to respond to traffic calming um, because it feels disingenuous to have executed a plan, tell people we have a plan, but then not have any money to respond to requests that we get. John, are you still with us? So I believe that we had this discussion before and the thought was that we don't know, we're not budgeting that for that because we don't know what the costs are and that those items would be baked into other street projects as they came up versus individual attempts. Oh, John, did you hear Bryn's question? Yep, yeah. So one recommendation I would have, um, on that. So we, myself and Ryan are going to be pretty tied up with Main Street next season, given that, assuming it's in construction. So a line item could be, we have to evaluate a street for traffic calming. Uh, our goal is to do that internally. Um, but we would, I think the first go around, have a consultant do that evaluation. And then we would just copy their format going forward. Um, so one thought would be to add five grand in for a traffic calming evaluation. But then the cost of actually performing the work is is tricky because you don't you're not going to know until you actually do that evaluation what the correct measures are. So for example, like is it as simple as putting in speed bumps or is it putting in curb bump outs or you know, the, the measure, whatever the appropriate measure is, is going to drive the cost. And until you do the evaluation, you're, you're not going to know. So, and that would get built into the capital plan um, as, as, a, as a line item. So there's, there's two things. There's the operational sort of evaluation piece that eventually we will just take over internally. And then there's actual, the actual construction, capital construction piece. I find it really hard to hear all the complaints and, you know, have personally experienced some um, some very fast driving on the secondary class two, class three roads um, on crosswalks that have yet to be painted um, because that budget hasn't been fulfilled for the last couple of years for various reasons. And then you know, we don't have a mechanism. We don't have any funding to do an evaluation. We don't have staffing resources to do ourselves. But then to have an excuse to say like, well, we don't know what the measure is going to be, but we don't. And then it comes back to, well, we don't have a budget to implement any measures we have anyway. So it, it just is, it doesn't sit right with me. Um, so I, I guess starting it, even just having some funding for evaluation and third party audits is shows some momentum, shows some progress, you know, in absence of anything else. So 
So if that's something we need to vote on, then I propose we vote on that. Um, is this just something you want added to the Excel workbook? I, I'm, I'm just following your lead. You said if we needed to vote on something, so uh, it's it's up to you, I guess. Elaine, how big of a scenario requires voting? Well, so given it's kind of up to you, uh, because given that the increase in my recommended budget is already 5%, which is almost double what it usually, more than double what it usually is, uh, it just we can include it in the Excel workbook, but uh, it might be helpful for you all to have a sense now whether you would all support even looking at it. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Um, I mean, personally, I I think this is new and addressing it, that's a small dollar amount, addressing it out of reserves funds makes sense. I don't think putting it into a budget this strained is something I support, but I'm, there are two more people, three more people here. Sorry, Thomas. You can make a you can make a motion. So I propose that we add five thousand dollars to the capital fund for evaluation of street calming um, to pay for third party consultants to evaluate um, as laid out within the traffic calming plan adopted FY twenty three. Second. So there's a motion by Bryn and a second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay. Motion fails. Um, are there other items on folks' minds? For this particular presentation, correct? Um, no, let's go back because we didn't do this at the previous ones, too. <laughs> I want to make that an item for the next. We'll do it next time too. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to say, have a chance to go back and think about the other presentations we've seen, I do want to bring one up from the community services presentation. So we had a conversation about the grant funded roles that are being continued in that budget. And Jim, you had a good way, you had a good way of saying this. It was like, I, I would like to see the impact if we didn't keep any of those grant funded roles to the core services that Ray mentioned. So it was Thrive, Library, Garden, Senior Center, Meals, um, Pool, and um, Soccer, I think were the, what Ray framed as the core services. Um, so I actually don't know if I'm allowed to make a motion. I believe you are. I can't. Okay. So I'm going to make a motion to request seeing a scenario of what excluding those grant funding positions would do to the cost and to the delivery of those core services. A second. There's a motion by Christina and a second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. And again, you all have some time to go back and look at the past ones and bring to our next meeting if there are other scenarios you want to see. Anything else on anyone's mind, budget-wise? I do want to make one. Did you have anything more? I have one, but I think we're going to talk about it in this next agenda. In public safety. Yeah, let's hold yeah. till then. Yeah. Um, I do want to make one statement, and I talked to Elaine about this, and Elaine, please correct me if I misspeak, but it's about um, the use of ARPA in TIF revenues. So just to like, for all of us to think about this and, and for the public, what is being proposed um, includes a buy down of the, the tax increase using $409,000 of ARPA or reserves. So I think that that's about half of ARPA still leaves like a million in reserves, which is healthy. Um, but it also does force us or pre-commit us to when we receive TIF revenue next year, backfill that 
And so what we've looked at so far with TIF revenue is with the existing obligations and Main Street having about $430,000 of TIF revenue still available. And so moving forward with this budget, we are pre-committing almost all of that to what the decisions are we make in this budget um, without having done a robust public process around the TIF funds. So I just wanted to make sure that we all are aware of, of that. And, you know, we are almost certainly going to see increased expenses as we do year to year with inflation. And we are putting some positions on hold and hoping to bring them back. So there'll be even additional costs. So there has been a narrative that potentially with TIF revenue, we could see some flatter tax rate years. And that is highly unlikely in, in the scenario we're considering. So just some food for thought. I, I would like to amend or add to that we're pre-committing ourselves to one of two or three solutions. One is severe cuts in a year. One is a deep increase in the tax rate in a year or basically no flexibility in the TIF. So there are- Yeah, you're right, you're right. Thank you, Jim. But all, none of them are, like you said, the only one that's going to feel easy is the one that doesn't include additional public discussion about how to use those additional funds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't... We don't need to get into a debate about it. I just wanted to, to make sure that we all are aware of that. Um, but if there are any questions, there are questions from the public. Okay. If we are ready, then we can move on to item B. Um, Elaine will provide us an update on Chittenden County Public Safety Authority. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna open that now. I'm basically going to be reading from the cover sheet. So those of you who have digested that can just uh, tune me out for a little bit. So on town meeting day of 2018, Winooski was among the original six cities or towns, that is municipalities, that voted to create regional dispatch for our region, meaning one center that would provide emergency dispatch services for those communities. This regional dispatch effort is known as the Chittenden County Public Safety Authority, or CCPSA. The five municipal members as of October 2022 were Burlington, Colchester, South Burlington, Williston, and Winooski. In November of 2022, the Williston Select Board decided to include only fire, which for them includes ambulance, fire dispatch services from CCPSA, in their fiscal year 2023-2024 budget, which is the same year that council is considering now. On November 29th, 2022, the Colchester Select Board voted to remove all CCPSA contributions from their fiscal year 2023-2024 budget. They also notified the CCPSA board that Colchester does not intend to pay the fiscal year 2022-2023, meaning current year, additional contribution requested by CCPSA that would have helped meet startup costs for the regional dispatch. On December 19th, 2022, the CCPSA board discussed whether and how regional dispatch could continue under these funding constraints. South Burlington City Manager Jesse Baker said South Burlington was interested in providing dispatch services for other municipalities in the meantime, assuming that at some point regional dispatch would be ready to be stood up again. Um, Jesse Baker said it would take a few months for them to come up with a proposal. The city managers, meaning my uh, recommended budget for fiscal year 2023-2024 for Winooski includes the Winooski allocation that was voted on by the CCPSA board at their November 18th, 2022 meeting. That allocation took into account Williston's condition, decision but was before Colchester's decision. My recommended budget also includes an amount for administrative support for the police department, which is really specifically geared towards records management that we would still need to do for ourselves, uh, for police, even if dispatch services were provided by CCPSA. Currently, 
Records are, um, records management is done by our dispatch staff at the police department. So after regional dispatch services um, are taken over, are taking over our dispatch, we would still have that remaining records management uh, need. So after consulting with the police chief, the fire chief, and the finance director, I recommend that the regional dispatch related budget items, meaning the contribution um, and the admin support, stay in fiscal year 2023-2024 budget to give us some flexibility to respond to a South Burlington proposal to provide dispatch services to Winooski. So I wanted to make sure, you, I'm not asking you to do anything right now uh, per se. Of course, happy to answer any questions. Uh, the reason why I'm explaining this now is so that you have some time to think about it in case you have questions for the police or fire services next week when you receive their budget presentation. Um, also to make sure that um, that there's some public understanding of why I'm still proposing regional dispatch expenses, even though there is public awareness of uncertainty that regional dispatch can uh, be stood up in the next fiscal year. Thanks, Elaine. Thomas, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just, and maybe this is better for next week's meeting, but what it sounds like to me is that regional, without Colchester on top of Williston, that regional dispatch likely isn't going to be financially possible. And in which case, I wonder, does it not just make sense for us to continue our own dispatch instead of signing on to something with South Burlington? Right, that's a good question. And um, fire and police will get can get into more detail next week, as you mentioned. Um, but right now, so are it, there are some challenges especially for fire dispatching it's there it's not to say they aren't surmount that they can't be addressed um but part of the part of the reason why um council was interested in regional dispatch back in the day and the community my understanding is the community voted for it is because there is the potential for cost savings for winooski to have regional dispatch for both fire and police through regional dispatch so as long as that's the case then uh, there's a reason to keep pursuing it. If that if that is not the case, for example, if we can't stand up a center without Colchester, um, and only or potentially only doing fire at a lesser cost, then right there there's other avenues that we might need to explore. They will probably be more expensive. Uh, I mean, without without some ch changes in how we've designed the regional dispatch. Um, um, staffing at the very least. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Looking forward to the next presentation. Is there anything, uh, Fire Chief or Police Chief, you'd like to add, John or Rick? At this time, you're welcome to pick it up next week instead. I'm all set, thanks, Elaine. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, will we get more information next week on the kind of content of that December CCPSA meeting um, in terms of the kind of options that were discussed aside from South Burlington picking up the um, operations? Um, it wasn't discussed really with CCPSA. I'm trying to think through what, um, I mean, honestly, the other option was to disband now. Okay. Um, we've discussed some other options internally, but that was what was discussed with CCPSA. Got it. Thanks. I have a question, which this might also lean more to next time. Um, thinking about this budget as a level service budget, I guess, how does this this kind of regional dispatch, especially considering the issues arising from it, kind of fit into a level service budget, similar to the mayor's concerns about continuing ESSER funded positions. This feels like it might go beyond this idea of level services, especially considering how much of or that it is such an increase on the budget. Yes, actually it is not a I, I did not recommend a level services budget. I it was confusing. I, I you know there's I presented three scenarios a level service budget, what that would look like, what um 
what was the other one? I've forgotten the middle one. But the third one is actually my budget, which is a mix of what we need to be investing in, which was really just regional dispatch because of the, the near-term commitments, some cuts and level, and then the rest is like level services. So, oh, the cut budget was the third one, the second one, or the hold budget, if you will. So my recommended budget is not actually a level services budget. There's portions, there's some departments that presented uh, what a level service. The regional dispatch is actually a, a new piece. Okay. Thank you. I think that's good clarification for community members too. Right. So you might look back on that slide in from my budget presentation. There was like pluses and minuses and red and green. And <laughs> so that that was like a my attempt at a visual representation of what could be considered level because it's in black, what's considered uh, a cut or a hold in with a minus um in green because it's a revenue, you know, it provide provides some capacity in the budget. And then the red is adding to the budget. Another question I have, um, and let me know if this is getting too much into the weeds, and again, if it should wait until the next meeting, is that question, if we don't put any money forward, is there a chance for this to be postponed? As it's other, yeah. It's a possibility. So... Right, it, it is something that council could consider. Um, again, the the recommendation from me after consulting with the chiefs is to include it, but yes, it is something that you can consider leaving out for this year. My understanding is that South Burlington and Burlington, South Burlington wants to move forward and has the resources to move forward. Burlington has to move forward with some, they need, they need additional capacity for dispatching. So they're gonna do something no matter what. Um, whether or not our participation in that kind of hopefully a transition phase from the CCPSA perspective, uh, whether that's is going to make a difference to them or not, I don't know. Um, my guess is we're a relatively small player, so it might not make a huge difference. So it, we, I don't know that us postponing a year would necessarily threaten the viability of an eventual regional dispatch. Again, that's speculation. We haven't seen the numbers, haven't seen that um, opinion from South Burlington. Uh, but it, if you're just looking from, in terms of viability for CCPSA, in ter, if you're just looking at the Winooski budget, that's a choice that you, you do have available to you. Okay, that's helpful context too, of just kind of how the other municipalities are thinking about it. Um, I'll also mention that Williston has to do, well, I shouldn't say have to. My understanding is that they are expecting to join regional dispatch with police dispatch in three years. They had to act now to secure a contract for police dispatching because they lost um, state dispatching services for police. Uh, I mean, it's just, they lost state dispatching. So they want to sign on with fire. They can't afford to do police this year. And so they're uh, they can't wait to, afford to wait for police this year. So that's why they signed a three-year contract for police this year. Gotcha. That's also a helpful contract. If only all of this could be handled by the state. <laughs> they tried for some time and it didn't work out. And that's why we're in this situation. <laughs> and, uh, and if I haven't mentioned it yet, um, Colchester is interested in fire dispatching as well. Okay. Interesting. So it sounds like there are several different avenues, but it's very unpredictable at this time. It, it is, right. It's hard to know how the numbers will shake out. The, and again, my recommendation is what I presented earlier. Yeah. And I, yeah, I guess one of my other concerns is just Winooski taking on a burden for um, towns that have much higher budgets and just the fairness of that to our residents, especially considering it affects our taxes. But it also affects how we're able to provide fire and police services. That's all true. And just to address that concern, so the way the the agreement is set up between the the regional dispatch members is that we are 
budget or our um, our fee to them is based on our percentage of the calls. So when I said earlier, we're a smaller burden, we're calculated, I think it's at 10%, and we're the smallest share of the total of out of any of the communities. Uh, Wollston is next at 11, I think. Gotcha. So the, we, there was this proposal to cover for Williston partially delaying. Right. There was the anticipation that once they joined, there would be some sort of refunding going on. Gotcha. But okay. That was so like we hadn't even stood it up. It just <laughs> didn't seem worth mentioning at that point because there was so much uncertainty. But that is that has been the assumption among the members for some time. Gotcha. So the goal would still be to balance it out eventually to ensure yes, that, that would be the goal. Yeah. Right. But you know, there's always the risk because if as costs increase, it might not show up as a savings or a refund. Gotcha. You know what I mean, so it, yeah, that's one of the reasons I haven't mentioned it. But yes, it's been considered at least. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. This is for mine. Elaine, um, so if the cost allocation as it's proposed right now is based off of number of calls, is there enough predictability in um, in our use or our demand so that we can actually budget adequately for it if we are to move forward? That is a good question. Um, I don't know if Rick can predict what crime rates are going to be, but certainly all you know all the steps that they do and the fire department do for um, early intervention and prevention on the fire side it's community risk reduction activities it's inspection you know public building registry activity on the police side it's community policing building relationships i would say it even goes into community services in terms of like making sure people don't uh, you know feel included and don't feel like they've got a this other avenue you know there's a lot of a lot of prevention activity um, that we can help head that off, but it is overall out of our complete control. Right, because I, so, as I understand it, there's some instances right now where, you know, we have some under-resourcing within the police department staffing. Um, I believe there's some cases that are not, that are going uninvestigated um, related to potential drug crime in the city. Um, due to lack of resources. So just kind of considering resources and how availability of resources impacts the need for and demand for calls um, and how that the correlation of factors and just wanting to see if if that demand model is actually um, going to be financially um, predictable. stable and, and predictable enough rather than a per capita model um, or something, something, some alternative. I see, right. Um, I'll ask Rick to see if what he can say to that uh, next time. Um, I will say that just to respond, uh, a nuance on what you said earlier is crimes are being uninvest gone uninvestigated because of lack of resources. That's not perfectly accurate. There is investigation and follow-up. What there isn't necessarily is the tools, the same tools that we used to have to resolve those more quickly. So that, that means that other resources have to be brought to bear. Other tools have to be brought to bear. That might take more time. So I, I don't know that it's accurate to say that we're, we're just like letting things you know go like maybe in some other communities are rumored to, to be doing, is that following up takes more time um, because of some of the prosecutorial tools that we no longer have. I think that uh, clarification is really important because I think the perception um, in the community it might be uh, the former rather than the latter. So I, I do think that that's very, very um, important and valuable clarification. Yep, thank you for that opportunity to to explain it here and encourage you to to you know ask Rick for any details he feels appropriate to share next week. Um some people have reached out to me directly and I've tried to do that, but yeah, I think you're right. Like any chance to explain that nuance is important. Thank you. Any questions from members of the public? Seeing no further questions, this is on for discussion. We'll move on to item C, 
This is on for discussion approval, the Just Cause Eviction Charter Change Voter Back Petition. Okay, hey, so those who regularly watch council meetings know that council considered at their August 8th and September 6th meetings whether to put a charter change on the ballot that would empower the city to put evictions protections, also sometimes called just cause eviction, into its ordinances. Staff advised that we would need to pause other work to be able to advise the just cause eviction charter and ordinance uh, changes. So council ultimately decided uh, at the September meeting to hold off directing staff to work on this until uh, the housing initiative director position was filled. Tonight's agenda item is regarding a just cause eviction charter change that was not proposed by city council or city staff. Um, I don't know per se who did write the, the language per se. Um, the petition signatures were submitted to the city clerk by staff of the nonprofit Rights and Democracy, just in case there's any confusion out there where the source of this language is. Um, as is required by state statute, you know, regardless of whoever wrote it, the city clerk examined the signatures from the petition and accepted it, meaning that also by state statute, city council is now required to place the proposed charter change on the next ballot which is March 7th, 2022. And council is only allowed to make technical changes to the language, meaning that they don't change the substance of the proposal. Um, also, uh, city clerk Jenny Willingham alerted me today that we need to warn the charter change by this Friday. So if I had realized that earlier, we would have warned this agenda tonight a little bit differently, um, but I'll ask you to, to uh, approve the warning anyway so that we can meet that uh, statutory deadline it would be technically well actually no we've already accepted the petition so we can't actually delay it at this point uh, so the proposed charter change language is largely the same as what was approved by the vermont legislature for the burlington charter and was subsequently vetoed by governor scott in 2022 so just in case folks have been following this um the saga between burlington and orwinuski you've probably seen the language before I consulted the city attorney and there are three technical changes that are needed to the proposed charter change um, signed by the uh, by 5% of Winooski voters, or actually more than 5%. Um, changing the Vermont statute reference in the first paragraph from 24 VSA 2691 would have to be changed to 17 VSA section 2645. This is fairly technical. Um, that the 2645 section addresses, among other things, that municipal charters may be amended by a petition of 5% of voters in the municipality. Actually, that's just a, it's just a, a what do you call it, like a prelude to the war what would be the warning, so you all don't even really need to worry about that. <laughs> um, changing the reference, uh, the another another technical change that would be needed that for the warning on the ballot, um, that would be changing uh, from Vermont State Acts of 1949, number 298, that relates to Burlington, it would be changed to our charter, which is uh, Acts of 2013, number M-9, which relates to Mooski. And finally, the better place to insert the change in the charter is in the Winooski charter is, is section 304. Um, that's not, I put 306 in my cover sheet, so it's actually 304 according to the city attorney. Um, 304 is the general powers and duties section and it would be a new subsection of B, and it would, so it would be number 13. So I emailed this to council a little bit earlier. Um, if you'd like to see it on the screen, I can share my screen to make sure that the public has had a chance to see what the changes are um, that we would be asking you to warn by Friday. Uh, you just need to approve the, the warning uh, tonight. Um, so again, by state statute, the city must hold two duly warned public hearings before the vote on the charter change. The first one must be held between 30 and 40 days before March 7th, so that would be between Thursday, January 26th, and Friday, February 3rd. The second one can't be held later than 10 days after the first public hearing. So all that said, tonight we have three asks for you. One, to approve the warning with the technical changes, uh, to ask you when you want to hold the hearings um, for anyone's benefit, but also that they have to be in the warning. And then finally, this is a, going to be a little bit lengthier, whether you want to direct staff to prepare information to present. Um, this is, it is a little bit dicey when um, 
staff or council are trying to educate the public regards to uh, ballot items that we did not draft because it could be perceived as trying to sway the public one way or the other. So it is, it's not a straightforward, necessarily a straightforward uh, question for you to say yes or no, you want to uh, staff, staff to prepare information to present. If you do, um, because of those considerations, I would ask you for parameters on time and money to be spent by staff on the education effort. And I would also recommend that you endorse an information sheet so that we're we're all on the same page about what it is that we're um, explaining to folks. I'm making these recommendations based on best practice, again, for transparency and accountability to the community. As is the case with any matter on the ballot, staff have the responsibility to educate the public on the effects of anything on the ballot. But ethically, we also need to avoid the appearance of unduly influencing the vote. For example, um, undue influence could be like, you know, you know um, really a hard-nosed advocacy for or against. Like if we said vote no or vote yes, that could be perceived as um, potentially unduly uh, influencing. Uh, just a reminder our, for the public, um, our job is to, as staff to carry out the will of the voters. And part of that is doing the best we can to understand what the will of the voters truly is. Um, and that's why there's an education effort in there potentially. Uh, finally, the reminder that if voters pass this charter change on March 7th, it would not be in effect then. The, per, the effect of the charter change is to empower the city to create an ordinance that protects tenants from eviction. So that means that if it if voters approve it, then the legislature also has to approve, and then the governor has to sign it or allow it to pass into to law without their signature. And then council would need to decide whether to take up an ordinance, and then they could decide to adopt it or, or not. Um, even then, there is still recourse for the community if council decided not to consider an ordinance or did consider it and didn't adopt it, voters could still petition an ordinance in a similar way that um, you petitioned this charter change. So just some clarification on even if it, this all passed and voters passed it, you would not see the effects right away. Uh, but again, the, the questions for council tonight are um, to approve the wording with the technical changes, when to have the hearings, and whether you want staff to, to prepare information to present to the public. Thanks, Elaine. Um, so I think we should first take up the wording and the hearing dates and then have a discussion about education outreach. Um, Jenny suggested two dates already, January 26th and February 3rd. I have problems with both of those dates personally, um, and so I want to make sure that there is some council availability and also, Elaine, what is staff availability for supporting those public hearings? Can you repeat the second one? February 3rd. But is that right, Jenny? It was January 26th, February 3rd. Uh, when you say support, could you clarify? Um, so hosting them, hybrid host them as, as we do, or at the community center, or whatever we choose to do. Um, and then if there were no counselors available, would staff be able to field questions and information? I guess first I should see if folks have availability on those dates. So I we don't advise against a Friday. I know that we have limited options and limited time, um, but I I do think that a Friday meeting is inadvisable if we can at all avoid, avoid it. Um, to your other question, yes, I'm available, I can attend. And then also I would expect city staff to be in attendance um, for whatever public hearing is available. Uh, to answer questions that council is not available, not um, well versed to answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I we would. I'm I'm having trouble picturing a date that we that staff would not figure out how to accommodate because the, the only one that we wouldn't is council meeting, and of course we would just be all together in a council meeting. <laughs> Um, and then just one last thing. I do think that we need to make it hybrid. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. 
I could also probably make both of those dates work. I should be able to do both of those dates. Yeah, I can make them work. Okay. Um, Jenny, February 3rd, Friday, was there? Is that a strict need? Um, it's not. The 5th is actually Sunday, which is the 10 days. Yeah, so it could be Saturday or Thursday. Do you folks have a preference on wanting to switch from the 3rd to 2nd or 4th? I think I'd rather the second than the fourth. I don't have a preference. I'd rather the second. I know there was, I think in Elaine's a memo note though that having a weekend date might be better for residents. But it also, people might also not want to do that on a weekend. Have we for some of our other um, activities we've seen um, Saturday morning be a more accessible date? Okay, that was going to be my question. If we had any data or any um, just from our from our recent engagement meetings, um, any just pulse on attendance. Yeah, especially the ARPA listing sessions, and Paul, jump in if you feel um, appropriate. Uh, we were seeing that conferring with the culture, I think it was we'd confer with the cultural liaisons, and they said, yeah, well, Saturday is easier for many people, Saturday morning especially. I could make the fourth work. Is anyone else able to? I can do the fourth. Um, can we post it later in the morning? Like 11? I have rental obligations in the morning, not Saturdays. Um, so if we could do 11, that would be great. If it needs to be earlier, that's also doable on the work. I, I can do 11. Yeah. I won't be available on the 4th, but it seems like there's enough people available. Okay. How about you? Uh, I might be able to hybrid in. Okay. Okay. So, and then the 26 is going to be, that's an evening, right? Yeah. That should hopefully catch a lot of people. Um, I have planning commission that night. So, um, I don't know. It depends on the time, I guess. Is it given enough notice? Is it possible to move the planning commission meeting? Maybe I can ask at the 12th. Feels like a charter change should take precedent if it's possible to move. But that was honestly, do we know if there are any other um, events or meetings scheduled for the 20, the evening of the 26th that would be a conflict other than planning commission? I'm not aware of any, um, anyone on the team want to chime in? I just checked as well. It looks like planning commission is the only thing for the 26th. Okay, thank you. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the warning language Elaine provided? Warning hearings for the evening of January 26 and 11 a.m. on February 4. Did I miss something? So on the warning, instead of include the entire text as technically adjusted? Yes. Okay. Can I ask one question that before we move sure, to the vote? Sure, sure. So um, Elaine, in your cover sheet, you say we have to add language that the city shall have the power to? But I don't see that in the emailed version of the language. Correct, because I, right, so I had put it in 306, which would have required that, but the attorney advisor could be in 304, which would not require that. Okay, great. So that's covered by 304. Exactly, yes. Thanks for your careful read. Okay. That takes care of my issues. So looking for a motion to accept the warning language and warn our hearings for evening of January 26 and 11 a.m. of February 4. So moved. Motion by Aurora, second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, so let's talk about education and outreach then. Um, 
I think what would be helpful then, Elaine, you mentioned like an info sheet. I feel like we could align maybe tonight on what the pieces are of that and then have, have you staff bring it back to a future meeting. And then, so let's talk about that. And then we can talk about for like distribution outreach. Um, so we need an FAQ, info sheet, whatever. Uh, as you mentioned, Elaine, it needs to make clear the process, like what the outcome of voting for this is. And timeline, estimated timeline. Estimated timeline. Um, I, I would like to see the operation and financial impacts like you had previously presented when we discussed this, something similar to that. Does that sound right to folks? I'm comfortable with that. Yep. Um, and I think also sticking with fact-based um, content, like what information we know, like how many landlords are on the registry, how many rental units are on the registry. Evictions data. Any, any evictions data we have. Um, basically any any data that would relate back to a decision um, in helping inform um, the community about the the benefit um, that that's sought from this change. Would it also be helpful to have a little bit of info on what the housing commission is currently working on just to acknowledge that we're do that there's other work going on too? Yeah, I was thinking something similar. And I don't, I don't know how to present this appropriately, but I think also like part of the operational impacts and the housing commission data is like, there's a balancing here and we won't do everything all at once, but we can't really clearly say what, you know. So I guess like, yes, a snapshot of other housing, the housing commission, other efforts. Um, and I think, um... Um, Sorry. Go ahead. Nope. I, I think in, in the context of that, I'm wondering if it's almost useful to say what the con what, what the recent history of work is. This isn't just out of the blue. Like this Turner change has been considered in this body and in that body um, for this topic has been considered in both. Um, I think that'd be helpful to have that history so it's not a, well, a new thing that the city is reacting to, but it's something that's been discussed in several venues. Kind of aligned with that, would it make sense to reference kind of what happened in Burlington or just keep it with Winooski facts? I could see providing links to news articles yeah. about like if that's useful background context for people, but that I think that's gets outside. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'd lean I'd lean away on okay. the Burlington side. Yeah. I mean, but if we're providing a link to the discussion we had, you could walk back into that too there. I would hope that some of the um some of the data around like the landlord the landlord registry, et cetera, um would also include some data around um just frequency of housing inspections. I, I don't see I, the connection. Yeah, and, and my, I, my one concern is one reason that this body chose not to progress this on its own is the staff resource costs and the housing commission is currently, this, this month is a pretty big lift for prepping for the housing quality discussions, which we prioritize at the commission and the council. So I don't want to under-resource the discussion of the charter change, but I want to be careful that we don't effectively do that by requiring too much additional data analysis for this, because that's one of the reasons we said. Yeah, that. I guess I don't see this data analysis just saying how frequently housing, the housing is inspected. It feels like it's one bullet point to me. And I think the chief has compiled some of that recently for the housing quality discussion. Um, let's see who's coming on now. Oh. Maybe 
Well, he, uh, since there's a pause here, if I could. So he, he mentioned that we don't have eviction data since it's a civil process. We don't have access to it. Just apply right. out of the bullet. So I think we can get county numbers. I, uh, I also think it's beneficial to articulate what we don't have. So if we don't have it, let's say we don't have it. Yeah. But that's different than if you were asking about inspection data. But it's two different things. Yeah, okay. Lane just mentioned eviction data. Yeah. I still don't quite see the tie on eviction data and, and inspection data because they wouldn't really connect. Is it more just trying to illustrate the volume of work already done on housing supports? Yeah, yeah, essentially in that factor in resource okay. resourcing for context. You you'll see some of that next week in my presentation. I can't get my video to come up, so I apologize for that. But um, you will see some of the um, workload, number of inspections we're doing, um, categories as as far as the code sets, types of inspections we're doing, uh, meaning the life safety code versus the Vermont rental codes. Um, I'm not sure how those equate to the eviction processes or number of evic evictions. We we've never looked at that data in that in that lens. All right. Um, Again, it's the resourcing link. Yeah. No, I I agree. But I think it can be me mentioned in the snapshot of housing work, other efforts that are happening. In that snapshot, do we want to provide, and this might be the chief in case this um, brings some attention, um, we do have a minimum housing complaint form that can be used both by folks in living in an apartment building, is my understanding, and if neighbors notice a housing violation, they can submit it. Would that be helpful information to include? in part just as a way to let people know that it's there. So, so would, would there be like, what are the operational supports the city already has in place? And then what is the policy context and discussion up to date on this topic? Would yeah. Those be the two I think that, yeah. Timeline context, current resource pictures. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. Jim, would you mind restating that? Um, what are the current operational supports that the city provides related to housing already? And then what was it? What is the recent policy discussion and context that the city is engaged in around housing? I think that's what I said. Okay. That's helpful. And you'll all have another bite of the apple once you see the draft. Yeah, I think having both of those really will highlight to folks in a way that doesn't feel like we're swaying one way or the other, just like, here's information. Maybe even just an opportunity to get information out depending on how things go. So those are two categories, um, and there was there also the third category of, well, four categories. Um, there's what's currently operational that we're already doing, recent policy discussions, process of the outcome of the voting slash timeline, and then operational and financial impacts. So those are, I'd say those are the four that I've heard. Is that, are you all in agreement? You wanna see that draft of those four here? Okay. Thank you. And then data points on rental units, landlords, and evictions. Oh, okay, right. So that would be a fifth thing. Thank you. I'll say the, the Charter Change Commission on the All Resident Voting put together a nice timeline of how a charter change progresses um, in a very simple graphic. So hopefully that's a critical thing. Sounds good. Um, and then just to, I don't have, I don't have any expectations here, but is there any additional information that would be helpful to incorporate related to the equity components? 
of this of this proposed charter change? It, that feels tricky to me because there's. Could we include there's some, the un there's some uh, potential, what do you call it, ripple effects Yeah, that are hard to predict which way it would go. Like it could promote equity or it might harm equity. <laughs> Those, I, I would have, I'd be hard pressed to put a factual, a, a factoid around. Okay. I, I appreciate the feedback. I wonder if that might be a place just to include the equity audit so people can just read the and maybe link the pages that specifically talk about housing equity in there, because that's just information that we already have for residents. And as you said, talk about some considerations of how this particular charter change could tie into that as. We I would it. lean away from it okay. based on what Elaine said. And also potentially this is a handout that shouldn't be too link heavy if we're going to do translation or something. That's true. No, I, I again, I don't have expectations. I just yeah. wanted to make sure that we discuss it. Well, I think it's an important lens to bring to you our, you know, somewhat privileged position as policymakers and not city staff to like, we can make that contextually, at least how we have viewed this, right? If we're going to talk about under-resourcing or talk potentially de-resourcing some part of our housing work in order to support this, like if that could look to us like a reduction in equity for some of our residents. And that's, I think so. that's worth having that conversation and being able to have that conversation. So I definitely don't, I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, and when we see those operational financial impacts, I think we can communicate what that means because it might just say like, oh, we're going to change FTEs from this to that, but what does it mean for what we're providing for the city? Um, or what I what do I fear as a you know as a counselor that that could mean for the city? Like that's something I think we should be prepared to be able to respond to and think about ahead of time. I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. And I I don't know if this would be of use in time, but would talking um, tomorrow about the agenda for our inclusion and belonging uh, commission special meeting. Is there any part of this that might be brought to them? I don't know if it can because of the warning. Do, do we have enough time for anything? Any feedback from the Inclusion and Blogging Commission before the notice, public hearing notices need to go out? Well, so the warning is what literally what you just approved tonight. Right. So that it, so you don't have to working. worry about being able to influence that. What you, if, since IMB is meeting next okay. week, Inclusion and Blogging is meeting next week, um, they, you could potentially ask for their input and then incorporate that into the info sheet. I think it, um, <laughs> if I can scrounge the time, it, it feels important to give you plenty of time with drafts. So I'm going to try to give you a draft next week. Um, not sure how complete it's going to be, but, um, it doesn't mean you wouldn't have time to consider it and consider other inputs, say from inclusion belonging before what's you. what's the date of that meeting? Sorry. So that's going to be on the 12th. Um, because which... technically you only need it. Oh, sorry, Rar. Um, I guess two different things that I, I could see is just bringing the language of the draft or what was approved by council if we do approve something on the 9th to inclusion and belonging so they have that heads up. And to kind of continue with another thought of just talking to inclusion and belonging about any ideas they might have about ways the city can reach out to community members and engage people in attending these meetings. I think that's probably the biggest thing um, and something that inclusion and belonging is already gonna talk similarly about the bud kind of budget presentations. I think that's the same discussion because we wanna tap them on budget outreach. The budget presentation is gonna include this charter change. Right. Um, and I think we need to be do I whatever. I think it would be beneficial to do a similar amount of outreach 
like align outreach on these two efforts. We have this charter change and also this important budget decision to make. Um, so I, you, you already have a schedule to talk about budget outreach, right? I would add this to that. Okay. And then if it, if the timing works out, I, I would be happy to have them review the draft. All right. I don't know that we, we, we wouldn't have to approve a draft at the ninth. Like right. we could give some feedback and then we still have the, the 16th and the 23rd before these hearings. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. And it would be great to get that, I think, out before the hearing. So yeah, that might work out really well if oh, Lane, if you're able to get a draft together by the ninth that council them provide feedback on that then inclusion belonging provides feedback on and then hopefully approve something on the 16th and then have the third 23rd as backup if necessary. I would love to wait to the 23rd. So first of all, we're on the 17th because of MLK Day. Um, the oh, thank you. Thank is, you. Yeah. Uh, is our housing commission meeting. And I think that would also be a, yeah. I think it'd be good to, if possible, have that and maybe gives you a little more breathing room, Elaine, in terms of developing content or having some of their expert input in the process. Um, and that could be, you know, there might not need to be a lot of discussion because the content is essentially the same, but having a chance to weigh in like, well, this is actually going to be on the ballot. What would you like to have the Housing Commission share, educate, what are those key points that they would bring to a kind of a discussion they never got that but would have to have now? Um, a consideration on timing um, that the mayor already mentioned is translation and how much time might be needed to factor in translation. Elaine, do you, or Paul, do you yeah, know? I can, like I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, you're going to need at least two weeks, depending on the volume of what you're translating. I mean, there's a lot of considerations for this, right? So if we're thinking about like a one-page handout, an informational flyer, um, you know, we'll want to distill that information, I think, you know, with as a universal reading level as possible. Um, once that happens and we get it over to either um, ALV or um, a different a different partner, it can take up to two weeks to get that kind of stuff done. Um, I I can't promise anything, but I think even more importantly than, than getting stuff just translated on, on the paper is making sure that that is, is delivered in a way um, that's actually going to reach people, you know, one-on-one um, -on -one meetings with stakeholders and uh, the Winooski School District liaisons and so on and so forth. I think that's the other the other heavy piece there too. Okay, but actually, I'm not sure if it met, like these public hearings are informational. The thing is going on the ballot no matter what, the way that it was petitioned. So like normally when we hold public hearings, it's because we're taking input to like change language or change action. That's not happening in this scenario. So it would be ideal to be able to provide flyers at those meetings. But if say we had interpretation available for the Saturday session and, and could get those flyers out through channels over the course of the month of February ahead of voting, I think that still meets the purpose because nothing about the, nothing about the ballot language is gonna change. Yeah, I ha I actually just had the same thought that if we if we're not able, you know, given that two weeks time, we can still have at least an initial um, English version um, available, and will and be working towards having a tra translated versions um, ready, uh, hopefully by early February. So, and I, I yeah, I hear I hear your thought on that, Jenny. As we move up. So, oh, Jenny. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, um, as far as part of satisfying what is required, it has to be in a paper at least five days before the hearing. So now we're backing up to the 20th, 21st. Well, just the warning, right? Not this info sheet. No, I think. but the warning. Yes. Yeah. Just, just so yeah. if, there's a, if there's changes going on. Um, there can't be any changes. Yeah. Just check that. Yeah. We, they've already made the change. The, this is the only change they can make. And, and to some extent, like this isn't our only opportunity to do oh, engagement on this topic. We have to do these two, but it doesn't mean it's the only two that we can do. Um, so I think that also should 
we have this mandated statute mandated timeline. We have to meet it. Um, if there's additional, if we need more time to produce and then deliver informational material, I think we can use additional yeah. areas if we need to. I I wonder too if even if we have a pretty solid draft that we could provide to any interpreters that could be there either on 26th if possible, but definitely on the fourth then they at least have some time with that content and can ask the city any questions about or any clarifying questions they might have. Um, I think that's sometimes appreciated. Elaine. So um, just to, to your earlier comment about the, what the point of the public hearings are, uh, it, of course, you're right. It's not like a typical where you're looking for input so as to revise. But the purpose in this case is to make sure that anyone voting knows what is in the information sheet, essentially. Yeah. To inform their vote. So in that way, um, if you're wanting to put information out, it does matter who receives it and that they receive it. Yeah, but we have four more weeks to continue distribution. Like, we can get information to the school liaisons later. We can reach out to the contacts we have in different community groups, which we should be doing for the budget process anyway. Right. I guess maybe sure. Elaine, what you're bringing up is that though isn't equitable to these folks because hypothetically other residents would be getting more information and more access to the city before other residents. Yeah. I, I, do, I personally don't think it's a problem if we're doing additional direct outreach and making ourselves available beyond these two formal meetings. So, we could call another meet, another hearing in February. Jim has a really amazing ability to synthesize conversation. I'm wondering if you are having any thoughts about this. I think we got to be honest with what we can actually do. That's that's my opinion. I think we can do a lot by the 26th. We can do more by the 4th. Um, and I think we don't have to stop there. So I think that's my opinion. Sorry. I we have to produce information. We know what information we want to produce. We would like to translate it before people have to make an informed choice. I think that, and if we have enough time to distribute that information. And so I would prefer to focus our efforts on a later engagement pattern that would get that information most effectively out to the most number of people. We have to do something on the 26th. So I would say we do the best we can because any education opportunity is better than none but that we have this additional time to kind of continue to help people understand the choice that they have to make. And I think we can we can give ourselves some grace on that 26th and even the 4th to have more opportunities. And that'd be my, yeah. that's how I'm hearing it from between what's, what I'm hearing from like we have to do versus what we would like to do versus be what we would have done if we were designing this process on a different timeline. Yeah, I, I totally agree that I think with the, the interest of getting inclusion and belonging um, uh, some opportunity to review by the twelfth, which is you know little little over uh, a week away. Um, housing commission on the nineteenth, and then a week later um, having the first hearing. Um, I mean, those sound like two essential elements that counselors have requested. Um, an opportunity to have time, I, like eyes on and feedback for, dedicated feedback for. Um, so I, I think, yeah, to some education is better than none. So I, I'd like to, I would also like to see that we have something ready for the 26th, even if um, we're not able to have it um, and translated in, in, as we would prefer to if we had more time. The other piece that I, I think we could, I was wondering about the housing commission info piece. 
but they haven't really taken any votes on positions. So I was thinking the chair could provide a summary of past discussion. So it could be like this info sheet could be supported by the past work of the Housing Commission without first waiting for the Housing Commission to look at it. Um, I'm not sure though, because it wasn't really a, I don't know that you can speak on behalf of the commission given the way the, the conversation unfolded. So, but I don't know, just amusing there, but I, I do see there could be some, you kind of already know where the Housing Commission stands on this topic um, to some extent. And I think it's important that they have a chance to provide input, but I don't want to hamstring the city staff to wait until the Housing Commission is met on a Thursday night to try and produce something for the following Monday. Um, so that's, that's the only, I guess that's my only kind of edit or change to what I proposed before is maybe the Housing Commission is taking more of a review rather than a contribution role in this to make sure we can get something on the 23rd that we can approve for the 26th. But, and this probably is best is putting a lot on the Housing Commission. I wonder if the at least the invitation could be made for any housing commission members to also attend the inclusion belonging commission meeting. Thomas? Well, yeah, I, was say, I don't obviously sit on either one of those commissions, but it seems to me that there is kind of an importance for the housing commission to see this if we're going to have another commission seeing it. And this is housing's realm. I, I don't think we can exclude them to just a review position. But I think they've, they've discussed many of these data points in the past. So I don't think this is a first look for them at the topic. And that's, that's why I, I don't. I don't know that they need to be the ones to generate fact based information. They could generate a position. It wouldn't be unanimous. And I would expect it wouldn't be unanimous and they could, but we would have put that in a fact sheet, I don't think. Yeah. Um, I think the commissioners could express that opinion in public hearings, but um, so I don't know that there's, I don't know how much new they would be providing to this conversation so much as sharpening or highlighting some points over others. That's what I would see primarily coming out of that. Can we ask what they prefer if they would want to? <laughs> It's kind of a decision that we'd yeah. have to warn, right? Yeah. But I think inviting them to the IMB would be great. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that any of, or of them can attend, but I think that would be helpful. If they see it on the 19th and you, and you can collect like summary feedback, when we vote on it, the final one on the 23rd, we can incorporate that into any anything we want to change. Yeah. I, don't know, I think it could look like minor tweaks versus major red flags. I think so, like yeah. There's a significant amount of work needed to change it, which I, I don't anticipate. Yeah. And I think that could be happening. Yeah. OK, so it does sound like we definitely can't do the 16th, which definitely puts any um, translation probably out of the question, because we can't ask for translation three days in advance. Right. I don't think we could have translated handouts for those hearings. But we should still pursue them for yeah. other distribution. Yeah. We could have them for the fourth. We could and not based on what Paul like maybe the fourth is one day shy of two weeks. So it's it's a solid maybe, but the I think it should be the goal. It should be the and, goal. Yeah. Yeah. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I don't think the 26th is possible. Yeah. And thinking about uh, the other question here is how much are funds to uh funds to Council to advise staff on the funds to use for these. I think probably the biggest would be providing translation of written documents and, and interpretation for any in person meetings. Yeah. And then I think we have a, we're going to have to have a follow up conversation after INB weighs in on outreach to talk about whether there's additional steps we want to take. That would have additional financial needs. Mm -hmm. But I think for the purpose of today, we could say that funding translation and interpretation would be a, a goal. Snacks. <laughs> um, thinking about location, so uh, due to hybrid equipment constraints, it feels like the 26 should be here. Ideally, both 
would be hybrid, as I mentioned, um, especially with your um, schedule. Situation. Yeah, your schedule conflicts. Um, does it make sense to have both meetings here or to have one at the O'Brien Center where there may be a larger, more comfortable space? Just we haven't talked about location yet. It's also, I think, with the my understanding would be really hard to do interpretation and hybrid without some substantial planning. But I think we could do be, yeah, able to weigh better way. You know, yeah, let's I, ask. Because <laughs> my understanding is the equipment is not mobile. The hybrid equipment is not mobile. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, so if the if the planning commission is in the chambers on the twenty sixth, they will. Um, you know, they will be using that, that technology that you're using right now. I don't know. I feel like it, the, we've had more luck with folks who need interpretation on Saturdays. We're saying that's where we want it. I think it's less important to have that one be hybrid given how events have played out. Yeah. These meetings have played out in the past. Yeah. So 26 here, presuming planning commission is moved. Yeah. And fourth at the O'Brien Center. We'll propose this to staff. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think that makes sense. It's the, it's out of the several imperfect solutions, this is the least imperfect. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, any public comment questions? Folks on Zoom, use the chat, raise hand. Okay. So Elaine rifled off our five to seven pieces of information for the info sheet earlier. We are requesting translated, translation of the handouts interpretation for the Saturday meeting. We wanna run it, the draft by inclusion and belonging on the 12th, housing commission on the 19th, then hopefully phone on the final at our 23rd meeting. And then we're gonna have a follow-up discussion at a future meeting after we get the input from INB on outreach and talk about additional outreach steps we might wanna take for both this and budget. Can I get a motion to Approve that, all that. So moved. Second. Motion by Bryn, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. I took notes, Elaine, so we will follow up tomorrow and make sure we're on the same page. Sounds good. Appreciate all that. It was uh, it was pretty clear, and I just got to make sure we can do it. <laughs> or rather that we do it. Okay. So... Moving on to item D, the all hazard mitigation plan. Okay, so federal law and regula federal regulations require local governments to develop hazard mitigation plans in order to be eligible for disaster funding from the Federal Emergency Management Administration or FEMA. These plans need to be updated every five years. Having and implementing hazard mitigation plans can reduce the impact of hazards when they strike and so can reduce the cost to taxpayers from recovering from natural or human caused damage or just on your own budget as a resident or business owner. In Vermont, the State Department of Emergency Management sets the update process. Our plan is an annex of the countywide plan. Uh, the document is not a very technical one. It is intended to guide city leaders and staff, but there's information in it that should interest residents, business owners, and those who are often in Winooski. Um, the maps are particularly interesting. So for example, there's a map on where the critical facilities are, like Vermont gas service areas. There's another map where the flood zone is, flood zones. Um, you'll see that almost all Winooski development is outside the flood zone and some public access natural areas are in the flood zone, which is smart. There's another map on single family versus multifamily homes where they are, which is an interesting um, data point for a number of reasons, not just for hazard mitigation, um, but certainly for that. And uh, another map shows where residential and commercial or other non-residential 
buildings are built were built like what, when they were built uh, with red being older and green being newer also there's a list of hazard events on um in in one of the sections those hazard events are an indicator of what we might expect in the future um, no surprise it's all storms and some flooding uh, the plan shows that there is just one hazard high hazard of concern to winooski which is if the dam on the Winooski River failed, meaning if it broke. Um, note that given the lack of development downstream of that dam, it is unlikely to cause loss of human life. Um, there could be significant economic or environmental damage, however. Um, there's another section on how we ranked the hazard risks for natural risks, as you'd expect from the history. Uh, we ranked storms as high. We didn't rank any technological hazards as high. The one societal hazard we ranked as high was crime. Um, on another page, you'll see the typical vulnerabilities of hazards of high, highest concern, meaning how and who would be impacted in case of a hazard like flooding. Um, there's another section on high crash locations and roads, which is might be of interest to the public. Um, you can also see what technical and fiscal capacities, capabilities the city has to support management of hazards and reducing vulnerabilities. And then finally, you'll see um, the action plan. Most of that is really responsible management infrastructure, which should be uh, what cities do as a matter of course. So that's just a brief overview of what the public could expect to see in a plan uh, in the hazard plan if they chose to rifle through it. Um, but with that, the, um, Jim did have some comments. I don't know if he wants to raise them now, but um, I'll take any other questions too. I can I can raise my comments now. Uh, thank you, Elaine. Uh, the one I that I have two one is um, there's no reference to uh, the hazards from uh, 35 crashes in the city. Um, there was you know the most recent one of several was uh, a few weeks ago in Fort Worth. So I think that's worth um, continuing to keep an eye on as a hazard to our city that we don't have much control over, but certainly will be impacted by their intake off if there was a crash. Um, the and, I, and Elaine, I know you provided some context on that, so I can let you uh, respond, maybe what your recollection is there. Um, but I think it's something maybe should be keeping an eye on and tracking as a hazard to our community. The other item that I would encourage the city to include next year in the annual update is emerald ash borer uh, hazard. Are currently, the matrix rates invasive species as a minimal risk, um, but emerald ash borers within a uh, single flight season of Winooski. So if it's not already here, it's going to be here in the next year or two. And I will hazard that by the time the next time this hazard plan is put, updated fully in five years that um, many of our ash trees will be dead and falling apart and recognize that re represents significant risk to life and property in the city as they fail and a huge burden of cost to remove by the city it solely in our public areas, let alone what people face in their private area, private residences or private lands. So I think it's something that we should be also recognizing for the, the life and property hazard that it is in the city. Do you want to comment on the F-35 thing, Elaine? Sure, so I did ask, um, I had a first meeting with the, the the commander the of the, yeah, of Vermont Air National Guard. Uh, Colonel um, Finnegan. And at that time, you know, I took him at face value. He said that um, I think it's like half a million hours of flight time with F 35s. And there was one crash over where there was over a million dollars of damage. Uh, something like, don't quote me on the details. Um, my notes are in my notebook, which are in my office. So the Based on that, I thought that the risk was low enough that we wouldn't mention it, but of course it's up to you if it's something that you feel that we should be addressing. Um, I would suggest that it be include if you do want to do that, that we do it in the next annual update, um, just because we're already a bit behind, not to any fault of um, the cities, but uh, the state is hoping to wrap up this particular update. My recollection from previous discussion is that it wasn't viewed as any different than any plane crash hazard here. And so that's why it hasn't been called out historically. But we 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 could ask next year. Well, I think the one one question that arose during the basing decision and discussion afterwards was that there's 
a, there's a fundamental difference of the materials on the plane, including exposure to hazardous chemicals, should that one of those crash in a highly populated area. And it's, very, it's fundamentally different from a commercial airliner and that those emergency response details were never shared with the city as I understand it. So what happens if a plane crashes here? How do you, how many, how far does the hazardous chemical exposure spread? Like we don't, as far as I know, we've never received that information. So I think that that's, I think that this, it is a different craft than anything else that's flying out of the airport at this time. And I think it's worth, um, it's worth us having an understanding of what hazard we're truly facing in terms of life safety for a crash here. It's a physical footprint, but there's also the chemical footprint. I would agree with that. And yes, that next annual update seems appropriate. Um, and I think it's something that we can, I would like to see that become a part of the conversation with the, the guard is how their emergency operations will support people in our community if there's a crash. So I've never seen that. Thomas? Um, I have a few things um, in addition, maybe not as consequential as Jim's, but um, on page five, Elaine, it references the church being an emergency shelter, but I, I don't know which church that is. So I'm hoping that can be updated just to indicate which of the few would be that emergency shelter. Um, and then in the history section, again, very light, but um, it kind of ends on a negative note. So I was wondering if maybe we could include some newer history, like maybe the like our hundred year celebration or the election of a first female mayor, I think um, ending on a, the dismissal of a city manager. Uh, I think we've done a lot since then, so. I'm sorry, which page was that on? That's on page three. I actually noted something else on kind of that page. He was just coughing. Um, also on page kind of two and three is if we wanted to specifically update um, any of the history section um, with the specific language we have in our, um, from our land acknowledgement because I think we have some possibly more updated information that could go in there. Yeah, that would be great too. So history of female mayor, um, land acknowledgement. I'm sorry, was there, there was another one you said, Thomas, right? Yeah, on page five, it references the church as being an emergency shelter, but it doesn't say which church. Right, I did get that. I meant in the history. Did you have something else for the history? <clears throat> oh, I was I was just saying that it ends in two thousand eight, and it ends on a negative note. Personally, I just don't think that's a good way to end it. We've done some good things since then. I recommended that we've elected a female mayor, that we've celebrated our hundred years. It doesn't have to be either of those things. Happy for anybody to come up with something else. We definitely have bullets in the master plan that are more recent than two thousand eight. <laughs> <laughs> And then I just had one more question, um, and I'm sorry I forgot to write which page it was, but at the end of the document we talk about underground electrical um, on Main Street, um, and it says that it will cost about 2.6 million, and I was just wondering if that is a cost that the city would bear alone, or if that would be a cost that would be shared by GMP and the other utility line users. Let's see. Um... John's gone, but my historic recollection has always been that there is a cost share with GMP, with the utility. Angela, I, the numbers I've never seen. I don't know specifically those numbers. I know that the undergrounding of utilities for Main Street is higher than that number. So I imagine that that does include a cost share um, having been deducted. Okay, thank you. This also could be an out of date document. And I just found the page. It was page 60, if anybody's wondering. I have one time question, I'm hoping, on page 26. Um, 
It has the municipal office and the fire station overlapping. Um, just wanted to confirm that that's, I see it looks like that's what Burlington has too, that that's just kind of standard for these plans. So it's incorrect, right? It's incorrect. I asked them to correct it and they said they couldn't do it in time this year. So we'd have to take care of it in an annual. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if Burlington noticed too. <laughs> so, um, given the uh, significant facility improvements at the school, um, there's no mention in here of solar or any backup um, energy um stored energy uh resulting from that solar is that is that a capability or is all that energy sold to the grid i don't know the answer to that um uh, my guess though is that it's it's a small fraction of what they need so it would be hard it would wouldn't like it might add to their resilience but i don't know yeah because I don't recall there being any battery backup. Um, and given this recent holiday storm um, and the power being cut, I, I just raised the question to me if that. If I think that's they got a deal because it all goes back in the grid. That's kind of what I was from recalling as well. Yeah. So. Elaine, would you like us to adopt this resolution and then vote on changes for next year? Uh, that would be great. Okay. Are there any questions from public, public attendees? Or comments? Mayor, if I could, I'm not public per se, but- I would Excellent, to, yeah. I just wanted to um, give kudos to Elaine. Um, this process, was um, awarded a contract from the state to an out-of-state contractor who did this um, update. It's a new platform that um, emergency management um, pushed, pushed the, the county into, and this was a big, big lift. Um, it was through COVID, so that contractor was not able to come. It was all, tried, we tried to do it um, over Zoom. Um, it was very clunky. Um, we had an interim manager at the time, um, so there was a lot going on for us, and for Elaine to come come here and then pick the pieces of this, and I do mean pieces of this up and pull it together to what you see today, was um, a huge lift. So I just want to commend her and uh, appreciation for doing such. Thanks, John. Couldn't have done it without you. And John Rauscher. And Eric. Thank you. Um, can I have a motion to approve the resolution as provided? So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Aurora. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. And thank you for I'm the gonna... comments. We'll include them in next year. They're useful. Yeah. So do you, do you want me to vote? Do you want me to run a vote on this? Um, I wouldn't worry about it because you'll see them. Um, next time. Okay. And I then feel we'll like they're, the they're all reasonable, so we're happy to put them in the draft. Can I, can I ask that we still do a vote on these, given that I may not be able to vote on them next time? And can I just add? Um, I have a, a question, a clarifying question. Um, page 28 on the critical facilities, the historical markers and historic districts. Um, we don't have any historic markers indicated in Winooski, and I believe we had recently approved one. Yeah, that actually hasn't been installed yet. It's been approved at least. <laughs> We're talking about next year, right? Well, fair enough. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, let's make sure to remember that part of the and actually that map. We don't think that 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 um, outline is correct. So that's another one we'd have to revisit in any case. 
Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I mean, even just reviewing and updating page 28. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Might be a better way to go about it. Yep. Well, it's a good point about the marker, right? You know, it's good to call it those specifics that you're aware of. Okay. Um, so I had, looking for a motion to, for next year, update Emerald Ashmore, F-35 crash, historic section to bring it up to current, uh, correct the map on page 26 of the city hall and fire, correct the historic map on page 28, and note the school district uh, renovation with solar. Um, also, which church and as a shelter, actually don't know. And the church shelter. One. And then the, uh, the history. Okay, got it. Motion by Jim? Yes. Second. Second by Aurora. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion aye. carries, thank you. Thank you all for the attention to detail. Indeed. And a lengthy document. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Item E, public art spending. Okay, this feels like a little uh, luxurious, but uh, it's <laughs> timely in a way. So uh, mostly reading from my cover sheet, an arts district is proposed in the city's master plan and economic development plan. While public art is not a priority of councils for this fiscal year, I'm, I'm asking you for direction now because of a potential opportunity this spring. Um, anecdotally, there was an increase in graffiti in the city during the pandemic. Credit to <laughs> Councilor Oakleaf to pointing that out to me very early on in my tenure. Uh, studies show that murals can deter tagging and other so-called nuisance graffiti. At least one organization is interested in doing this in Winooski this spring, which is the opportunity I'm referring to, along the Riverwalk. But other individuals or organizations may also be interested, and I would recommend any such work be paid for. Um, so given that, and where does that money come from? Um, on August 1st, 2016, City Council established the Catherine D. DeCaro Winooski Public Arts Fund after uh, two city managers ago to expand the presence of the arts in the city. Uses of the fund shall include, I'm reading from um, the enabling, um, art-related opportunities from, for residents to enjoy, installations and exhibits to enhance the cityscape, and the use of the arts to promote a sense of pride, cultural expression, and celebration of Winooski. Um, thanks to Angela for digging that out. Uh, we have no existing procedure or policy to replenish this fund. The current balance in the public art fund is $5,501. Uh, made up of some council pledges and a donation. So I have two questions for you tonight, uh, if you choose to take them up. Um, there's plenty going on, so it will be understandable if you don't feel like it. Um, a, there, whether you would like to advance a public art initiative at this time using the current balance, and if so, whether you would like an existing commission or commissions to advise you on how to spend it. Thanks, Elaine. Um, this fund was established in 2016. It's never been used, right? As far as I know, Angela. Yeah. Um, if there's like a community effort that's that's driving this and low lift to staff, I'm not opposed to using this money and then having one of our commissions participate in that. Yeah, I, I think it sounds like a great opportunity. I think with especially looking at the language of the pride, cultural expression and celebration, if this might be good for either inclusion and belonging or possibly maybe safe, healthy, connected people, trying not to overload inclusion and belonging's plate um, or just popped in my mind. I wonder even if the, the library committee might have ideas, if maybe they, they know folks in the community who might be interested in doing work like this. Um, so those are those are just kind of the ideas that I come I I came to mind and I don't know if council wants to dictate that or ask if any commissions would be interested in it. And I'll also I'm add not, that, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um. Actually, so an art district that was proposed as an economic vitality measure, so it could make sense uh -huh. there. It could also fit with municipal infrastructure, uh, because some of it at least will presumably will be on the municipal infrastructure. I was just going to say, I, I don't, there's already somebody proposing something, a community effort. So I don't think we're like asking a commission to 
look for ways to use it for this particular but, instance, but to be involved in right. or to provide advice on on this thing that already is out there. Yeah. So my my impression is supporting the question is, do you want to support this opportunity this spring as question one? And question two is we don't have a procedure or policy at all. Do we want to uh, assign something to one of one of the commissions? Um, if any of the commission. So that's that's how I'm interpreting what your question is, Elaine. Is that is that correct? Well, so a, a nuance on question one is that there is an organization that's interested and they've a, a couple months ago they quoted me three thousand dollars. That would almost deplete the fund, right? It would be more than half. So part of my question is if you want if you wanted to proceed with that, then I'm not sure how much more, like Christine said, I don't know that you need a lot more input from commi a commission and there would be a low lift and it goes on from there. Right. So I'm seeing part of that is, do you really want to, would you want there to be more of a process rather than spend so much of one fund, a, a one-time fund on an organization without even a process for, of selecting who it is? So I, I would say that those are, Excellent follow-up questions. Um, it sounds like this, the intent was for this public arts fund to be something that continues well into the future and it is, and is not a one-time, but you know, I'll say if there's additional history there that I'm missing, you know, please correct me. Um, so I would almost see a the role of a commission is like how could funding be like two parts? How would we want to select, assign um, locations for our installations, as well as like how to um, allocate or propose funding allocations for it? Um, so I I guess I see that second part being, in my opinion, separate from the first ask. I don't see this the second part reviewing the first ask. Does that make sense? I follow. Okay. So the question, question one being, do we want to do art this spring? We already have somebody who has proposed to do a project and has already provided a budget estimate. Do we want a commission to review that particular project? I don't feel strongly about that. Do we want a commission to review funding allocations moving forward and project pop, like procedures, guidelines moving forward? Sure, yes, I, I do support that side of things. Gotcha. I, feel, I feel the opposite. I think we've got this money that's been sitting here forever unused. We have someone ready to use it. Let them use it, have a, have a commission though, have some input on, on like review their proposal. I don't think it's a priority to develop guidelines or funding mechanisms for this fund, given all the other things we have happening. Yeah, I, I disagree. <laughs> well, I mean, given that we have no plan to re-up it, um, any policies and procedures we would develop would be solely for the distribution of $5,000, which is a lot of some cost for a small pot. I would be tempted to put this to the Safe Health. My inclination is put this as Safe Healthy Connected People Commission, ask them to review the project. And also part of that review question is, is this the best use of this fund at this time? Or do you want to see a competitive proposal process? Like, I think that could be a part of their review is like, is this proposal in and of itself worth it and appropriate and well thought out? And is it so well done that we should just approve it as is? Or do you think this is like, yeah, it's good, but um, it'd be nice to have this opened up to other groups in the community have the chance to pitch in for these funds. I think they could do both of those at the same time and make a recommendation back to council. Because what I'd hate to do is walk away from the slam dunk. And what I'd hate to do is uh, just do the first thing that comes across because we could. So I think that would be a, a middle ground to, um, not doing either of those. I think uh, that would be my preference as well. And my sense is that Safe Healthy Connected People does have the would have the capacity to do that work at this moment. Maybe not this month, but definitely next month. I agree um, to your point. I don't feel like it makes sense to create procedures if we're not going to fund the fund. <laughs> um, 
I I would highly advocate that we that we do consider um, for economic vitality purposes, for municipal infrastructure purposes, safe, healthy, connected purposes. I mean, it's it's um, those are interconnected value opportunities, um, and I think it's uh, it's something that could be considered um, as you know, that's something the commission can consider funding opportunities, not necessarily that are exclusive to city allocation. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm missing, I'm missing the kind of, what would they consider an addition or instead of? Um, so there is not a cap that I know of with the um, downtown Winooski allocation. I believe that we um, just approved a 5%. And so having a potential cap on um, the, the city's contributions in downtown Winooski could allow for a percentage of economic vitality funding to be allocated towards the public arts fund. But um, is that the discussion that we need to have right now? No, <laughs> it's, I'm saying it's something the commission can consider moving forward. Sure. Like, not right now. I, I don't think we need to ask them that at all. Like, I, I don't think... I'm not supportive of trying to fund this in an ongoing way right now. Like this is a discussion to to parking lot for some future date. Yeah, I don't. Know. I yeah, I see it as if it was something to go forward. We then start leaning on staff because I could see it being something that would be great to like get donations or yeah. grants for, but that's a lot of staff work. Um, so, like. Like Jim said, I think we should take advantage of this opportunity, do have a little bit of review process just to make sure, you know, there isn't, I don't know, something that comes that is flagged by the Safe Healthy Connected People um, Commission just to have that um, second look and kind of float that idea of, you know, get it, yeah, if they think we should do a slightly different process for specifically the spring or spring slash summer. And then, I don't know, for some somehow pin the existence of this um, fund for to come up when there might be staff capacity slash funding capacity in the future. Does that make sense? Like, I love the idea of having procedure, but I don't also like the idea of taking advantage of an opportunity. Jim, do you want to motion what you described? Um, I move that we refer the proposal to the Safe Healthy Connected People Commission and ask them to make a recommendation on whether this is a good current use of the funding, whether they recommend this back to us for funding. I missed the latter part. You said whether yeah, good use of funding. Just and I, loved it. <laughs> um, I would move that we refer this proposal to the Safe Healthy Connected People Commission for the review. And as part of the review, ask them to consider not only if this proposal is worth funding, but if this is the right time to use these funds for this purpose. Does that make sense? I would like to second. I would like to second that motion. Motion by Jim, Elaine. The clarifying yes. Um, this by this proposal, do you mean the 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 cost and project proposal that I've already received? Yes. That's what I intended. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that what we were discussing? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, the proposal reference in the cover sheet. Okay. Motion by Jim, second by Bryn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. On to item F, equity update from staff. Okay, so again, mostly reading from my cover sheet. Uh, the budget recommended by the city manager, that's me, for the next fiscal year, July 1, 2023 to June 30, 2024, includes pausing the equity director position to help get down to a 5% tax rate increase. Members of the public have asked what this means for equity efforts by the city. 
The most obvious impact of pausing the equity director is that we will not have access to someone on staff with ex equity expertise and who is intimately familiar with the city in our efforts to create a more inclusive workplace and city. However, pausing the equity director does not mean all equity efforts would stop. The city's first equity director resigned effective July 2022 because during the year she was here, she concluded the role was not sustainable and experienced a workplace that was often felt unsafe or unwelcoming. Equity efforts have been underway before, during, and since her time with the city. Many efforts of significance like the equity audit, accessible communications, and the Inclusion and Belonging Commission were made possible or enhanced by her. The need to incorporate equity into all city departments was certainly made clear by her, and staff have more work to do on that. But many other efforts were initiated and are continued by other leadership team members in every department. So I'd like to review those tonight uh, for the sake of transparency. Certainly some of these things I don't feel are that obvious to, to members of the public. So welcome the, the opportunity to, to share them. Um, the activities fit into the categories of accessibility, voice, miscellaneous, welcoming, and awareness. And these are listed in order of number of initiatives or efforts per category. So for example, accessibility has the highest number of, uh, of efforts. Um, so I'll review a few examples, a non-exhaustive non list, uh, some examples from each category that are recent. Under accessibility, improving or adding sidewalks um, is one effort that has an equity impact. Uh, we've co coordinated with Winooski School District on sidewalk plowing prioritization for underserved households. Uh, this was a direct result of a recommendation by the former equity director. Uh, removing unnecessary qualifications from position descriptions. This is a common best practice to improve access to, to uh, good work, good paying work as I would, or good benefit work as I'd say uh, local government work is. Improved access to recreation program registration by reserving half of the seats for paper registrations and then in-person support for that type of registration. Um, improving readability of public communications um, by using a reading level review aid. Continuing to offer hybrid meetings. And then even just today, the finance director, Angela Aldiri, the HR director, Jesse Acri, and I met with a member of our extended Winooski community. Um, they had commented during my budget presentation regarding the proposed staff pauses with equity impacts and had reached out to me to offer ideas. Um, I do plan to revise my budget to incorporate their primary recommendation, which is to bring in more representation from the community for city staff to hear and learn from and to compensate those community members for their time. Uh, this is a model that has worked for that uh, particular individual in their work on equity. Um, after hearing the public comments after my budget presentation, um, Angela and I had combed through my recommended budget again and did decide we could comfortably add $50,000 of local option tax revenue based on updated projections this year and past experience. So $2,500 of this does go to downtown Winooski by contract as um, Bryn had just alluded. That would leave $47,500 we can add to the, pro pro the pro I'm sorry, the professional services uh, budget in the administration um, area. For the purpose of developing this, I'd call it a mediated community voice program. Um, this is really about, I'm putting it in the accessibility um, bucket because even though you know it's a voice, I just said voice, it's really about increasing access to city government by historically marginalized people. And I'll also underline that even the fact that this person was willing to spend their time meeting with us is itself an outcome of increased access. I had previously met with them in my effort to meet with everyone, <laughs> really hoping for that, um, everyone with a stake in Winooski, which gave them some assurance that I would want to hear their ideas. So again, I want to underline and commend council's efforts to, to get out into the community and, and hear from the community directly. Um, that sort of effort is important and I think is yielding fruit. The second category is of equity efforts I'd call voice. So um, those included that we conducted listening sessions on how to spend one-time money, meaning ARPA, 
with historically marginalized groups, including new Americans, which were interpreted, uh, youth and seniors. Um, that was a big effort um, led by the equity director and of course the communications director, Paul Sarn. Um, we considered how to best engage people traditionally left out of planning processes and developing city plans, such as in the bicycle and pedestrian plan that's um, upcoming. Well, we've created and supported inclu the Inclusion and Belonging Commission to create their own structure and procedures. And this body was an outcome of the Equity Summit of 2019. So that even preceded, um, as Jim reminded me, the um, Equity Audit or the Equity Director. We are piloting stipends for commissioners, um, specifically with the Inclusion and Belonging Commission to support more diverse participation on commissions. Um, to respond to a question from Bryn, unfortunately, I had overlooked that council had not approved these stipends before I had to start paying them. I was going off a grant agreement of $50 per meeting. Um, I've asked the commission, the Inclusion and Belonging Commission, to provide some input to council about what this means, the per meeting stipend, and if there's a better way to, to spend that. And then we would be coming back to you, hopefully, with those recommendations to formally approve a stipend policy uh, for commissioners. Um, Angel, I believe we're currently paying them quarterly. We are just for um, making it worth issuing a, a paycheck for the, the per check fee that we're charged. Um, we are also not seeing every member accept payment. Um, we do have at least one member of the commission that is opting not to take the stipend. Um, and we have only paid out, I believe, less than $200 to date for the first quarterly payment. Thank you. Um, so, and then, uh, so that's that item. So continuing in the voice item um, or the voice category rather. So planning with the equity consultant and the, we are planning with um, the Winooski School District next steps in engaging the public on equity audit findings. Under the miscellaneous category, the police department uh, partners with Howard Center's community outreach team to connect people to social supports who are involved in an interaction with the police department. Uh, we've we're been reworking the pay plan to value um, so-called caregiver positions, which have been disproportionately filled by women and people of color. And this was in response to the equity audit. We've also um, looked at allowing experience in lieu of formal education. Again, a best practice in increasing access to good jobs. Uh, working with Housing Commission to propose changes to ordinances to improve quality of rental housing. Obviously, that's been an ongoing effort. Um, we, Aurora and I, are participating on the city's behalf in Ideal Vermont, which is led by the State Office of Racial Equity. It's a municipal learning cohort. And uh, participation of city staff as well as council, although there's another agenda item tonight for that. Um, in the conversation about a school resource officer, um, that was in response to the Winooski student bans for action. In the welcoming category, the, the last two categories are much shorter, um, improving readability of the personnel policy um, so that once people are hired in, they have a they can navigate that document more easily. That's something the HR director is working on. Um, placing the equal op employment opportunity statement at the top of job postings, uh, not at the bottom as has been common. Um, I think that was actually a response to the uh, equity audit. And then um, again, in terms of welcoming, it's a small gesture, but some staff are uh, listing pronouns in our email signatures. In the awareness category, uh, we are conducting at the leadership team level, meaning like the department heads, uh, peer learning on equity topics. Some of the um, other departments are also doing this. And then equity workshops for leadership team members that were designed and delivered by the equity director along with partners. So again, just to close this, this um, diatribe, I guess, the purpose of this agenda item was to communicate to the public the types of equity work that are underway and that will continue to, that will continue, an illustration of what will continue. It's not the full list. We do welcome feedback on these efforts and on what else you think we should be doing. Thank you for outlining that, Elaine. I see Thomas is hand. Thank you, Elaine, for um, putting that all down for the public. I said it at past meetings that you and staff are definitely engaging in equity work uh, frequently in your in your daily work. So I'm glad that you highlighted that for everybody to know. 
Um, I wonder if you might have considered already out of that new, well, not new source of funding, but reallocating about $50,000, you had said, if for you and maybe other members of city leadership were to take um, like a, an official DEI certif certificate training, <clears throat> I looked one up, for example, at Bentley, it's about $1,700 $1, for the training. Um, which, you know, if you add up all of you and leadership, that would still uh, be less money than a full-time position at the moment um, and would give you some more of that actual knowledge and trained knowledge outside of just, you know, workshops that you do here and there. This would be an actual program. Um, I don't know if that's something that, the, that you uh, would consider for yourself and staff. Uh, thanks, Thomas. I'm here. I'm thinking about this for the first time, but um, <laughs> off the cuff, I'd say that um, I think what I what what I keep hearing from experts because I'm not an equity expert. What I keep hearing from experts is that most of us spend too much time training and not enough time doing. And that said, the ideal um, the ideal Vermont learning cohort should provide some of that opportunity because also you're right we do need more knowledge otherwise we risk doing harm when we're trying to do when we're trying to act so i'm hoping i i would just in this moment i would say that we should rely on those opportunities to get us some more of that knowledge do more of our own peer learning do some more of our own learning um but it to get to the practical pieces, we really need to be listening to our community members, and we're not hearing from enough of them. So uh, that's why I jumped on this idea from the community <clears throat> member of how we can increase that, that I would call it porosity between City Hall and what's outside City Hall, and who is outside City Hall. Thank you. And I... I like, uh, I look forward to your revised proposal with this um, suggested program because it does feel like it's action when we have done a lot of talking. Um, and I do think that is really important um, and listening when we've done a lot of talking too. Um, I have, I have a couple of things. Um, this might not be decided yet, but or something that you can share, but I was wondering about who the equity consultant is that school, the city and school are working with to decide how to get info on next steps for the equity audit. Yeah, so we, um, we Paul and I um, had an informational discussion with the consultants that facilitated the equity summit in 2019 under you know with the idea that they already have some knowledge of of Winooski and they could build on that more easily um Paul also had a really good experience with a previous with a trainer who um is planning to provide a proposal in partnership with another trainer that Winooski has experience with so it the, um if you want names I can provide them but um yeah the, that's those are the I'm just providing the reasons why we we started with those two. Awesome. That that makes sense to I think that was something I was curious about of if we are e utilizing current our relationships that we already have instead of seeking out. I, I think I, I've heard some concerns that it's just seeking out people who aren't necessarily in the community or don't know us as well, too. And the importance of utilizing people who have already are either living in Winooski or are already working with Winooski in some way. So, it's, right, actually, that's a good point. That's a they the people that we're considering don't don't live here, so it might be worth another look. It it might delay the event that we're thinking, but maybe it's you know that seems worthwhile. It would be ideal to reinvest the city's money in in local folks. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah, next next best is people who have worked with Winooski before that we know or that the community knows. Um, another thing I wanted to note, this is both for the community and also fellow counselors. Um, one of the items that you listed is the improved access to recreation program registration 
um, by reserving half the seats for paper registrations. I think it's really important to note, and something that Ray noted in the Safe, Healthy, Connected People meeting, is that a huge reason that they're able to do that work is because of the current admin and outreach coordinator, which is a position that was, funded, was originally funded by ESSER. So this is a huge both connection to the community and potential losing that position then could put us in a lot, you know, reduce a lot of accessibility and something that has greatly improved access um, and connection with the city. So I think that's really important to note too, is the different staff members who are making this possible, um, especially that item, which I, um, I've heard is really important. Elaine, I'm curious what the threshold is for um, putting out, a, like what, what the threshold dollar amount is for putting out an RFP for um, support uh, for consultation work and professional services. That is, I have it posted on my, at my desk, but I'm going to look at Angela right now. It is $10,000 is required for a formal RFP. Anything over $5,000, we require written quotes. Okay. Is that up? Is that a minimum number of quotes? Uh, at least three quotes if you're just obtaining quotes. RFPs, it's public RFPs. Um, we don't require a minimum number of responses. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I would say that this list, it certainly is not exhaustive. Um, I really appreciate compiling it. Um, and I, I think there's... There's a lot of um, great opportunity and, and benefit to having it be a working living document that, that we can continue to add um, items to as, as we take on um, additional action items outlined by the equity audit, but um, also just amplifying the some of the work that otherwise might not go no, noticed, but has significant impact. So, um, you know, some, some of the relational, um, work that's, that's hard to quantify is what I'm thinking. Right. And it, it's, um, I, I hope that the public heard, especially in this presentation is what's immediately coming to mind. I'm sure there's other examples of, um, how any position in community services is an intervention opportunity. Yeah. Yes, and um, in terms of the list, like I, I have the, the what, because currently the, the full list on the, on the shared drive and it just in compiling the re was reflecting, oh, and the fact that Jim, you know, to your point, Jim reminded me that, or alerted me that there was a report from the equity summit, and I had not been able to find it. I hadn't looked very hard. Um, so having, when you don't have it, when when it's an area that a municipality is not traditionally, um, uh, doesn't tr have a traditional department with, it takes something like this to turn it into a muscle, turn it into a habit and having a listing, having, you know, making sure that you're revisiting. You know, we have things like master plans to remind us of what the goals of the community are. We don't have that sort of thing you know, built into our DNA yet. So something like this is a start to that. Any questions or comments from members of the public? Okay. I wanna make one final note to actually to your final point, Vera Lane, is that we have in those areas under the master plan, we have content experts who are helping ensure that we have that data and we are doing that work. So part of having that muscle is ha having a content expert who is able to help the city ensure that this work is being done, especially on the city side. Um, and as you mentioned, quite a number of these items are in part due to the fact we had an equity director in the past. So there is that really importance that equity is part of 
every single position and all the work that the city is doing, but there also is that clear benefit of having someone who's able to um, have that expertise um, I see in this document as well. I would not disagree. Right. Thank you. We move on to item G. This is a related item. Um, City Council has also been a part of incorporating more equity efforts into the work of the city. Very brief highlight here uh, in this memo. What I wanted to spend a little time on with you all though was first reflecting on the trainings that we recently completed and then having some discussion about what we need to be doing as a council. Um, so I, I, I had reached out to you all a few weeks ago um, and didn't hear any sort of consensus themes, right? So I wanted to ask today, you know, reflecting on the training that we received, it was the same one that staff leadership received. If there's any like key learnings you walked away with um, that you wanna call out. So for me, what I really took away from the, the training, two training sessions, and um, this also came out in the equity audit, was the importance of um, like outcomes over intent. And it's something that I wanna keep remembering during decision-making, because I, I feel like we often do discuss intentions and we don't always know what the outcomes are. Um, so for me, that was a, a key takeaway. anyone else want to share? If there's one thing that I think kind of saw a little bit to today, actually with having folks uh, on our leadership team who are able to be remote for various reasons, um, is thinking about the way traditional structures kind of support white supremacy and limit access and not just white supremacy, but other um, forms of oppression. You know, it's not intentional. So kind of tying on to what you're saying that outcomes versus intent. So that's definitely something that was really highlighted in these trainings for me is thinking about those ways of providing access and the ways that some kind of tied to that too is almost building community and trust to be able to um, hold those spaces and to have that accountability and understand, and I guess, was, you know, understand where that people are coming from these different places and that we want to make spaces um, that everyone can be able to show up uh, and fully participate as themselves. For me, I, I think um, I tend to take the action-oriented um, takeaways where, um, you know, Councilor Hurd has already mentioned there's there's a lot of talking, but I think, um, you know, the, the summary memo that Elaine put together shows the action behind the talking. It shows the, um, the dedicated effort that city staff um, and council are, are um, putting into, um, you know, really exercising that um, effort, that muscle that, that Elaine just mentioned um, of making this part of our day-to-day. -day. Um, and, and that to me, um, I think having tangible, um, actionable items um, is, is to me what stands out most from those two sessions. I'll go next. Um, I think that well, it looks like Thomas was about to unmute. Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> um, I I think it was a helpful refresher on some of the ways in which, um, especially our approach to work and interaction, has continued can get wrapped up in white supremacy culture concepts of um, quantity over quality 
and uh, valuing certain forms of input, certain methods of providing thoughts and opinions about things that we tend to shy away from emotion. We want written information. So those are good refreshing uh, refreshers of those types of um, just some considerations to have when going into decision making, like, oh, well, what should we require be written? What should we require be said? And how should we respond to difficult comments directed at us? I think those are really important things to remember. It's it's not something you have to protect yourself from every time, especially in a public facing position. So I think that was helpful to have that reminder. And what I took away, kind of the place I got to reflect a lot during that training was around um, the ways that I listen and then the ways that I'll speak or um, try and summarize or reflect back what I'm hearing um, and using facts as opposed to impressions and uh, listening for the, the underlying like, why is this important to you? Why are you raising this issue now? Why are you saying it this way? And does that tell me something more about what I might otherwise miss if I focus only on the words? So I think that was really helpful to have some practice with that and some reminders or some new ways of kind of thinking about those communication skills. Um, yeah, I think I kind of just echo a lot of what everybody said. Uh, I've done so many of these trainings that I feel like what I I take away from most of them is really trying to, and the importance of understanding that everybody comes from a completely different background, even if you think that their background is similar to yours. It may not be at all in, in, in the slightest, and, and that forms the way that people come to a conversation or um just it's just day-to-day -day living and to to understand that as you go into something um and one of the things I, I mentioned to the mayor is that I think we should do more of these types of trainings no one organization or trainer um and I think the ones that we had came to us said they don't know everything there's no way for them to know everything and this world of DEI and everything that's coming out and evolving um so personally um, I, I'm I'm totally down to do more of them. Um, I don't know about everybody else, but um, just just keeping an open mind, I think, is 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 one of the most crucial things I learned from those, and I'm reminded. Well, that's a good segue into the second portion of um, the discussion, which is potential next steps. Um, and and we're not here to like vote on anything or make decisions that impact budget or operations. Um, but I wanted to do some, just get a sense of like how, so we just saw like a bulleted list of, of specific actions that staff are taking to incorporate equity into operations. And I want us to think about how we incorporate it into policy and community engagement separate from that, right? So like what, what can we do that doesn't involve operations or like staff and financial changes. Um, you know, for example, I think the community engagement strategy we developed is probably the most important thing we can, we have and, and can do to make more of those connections. Um, I think uh, it's a little loose right now. We can get tighter on um, actually putting that into practice. Um, and I'm curious what other, you know, another suggestion I had is um, an activity we did at my, the organization I work for was adopting shared statements on what does inclusion mean? What does equity mean? Um, to try to kind of ground us together, make sure we're aligned. So opening it up to, to other ideas. Um, I like the idea of kind of de developing those shared definitions and uh, so put forward, maybe thinking about even diversity and belonging. I think of belonging in particular because that's something that we are using a lot. Um, but I think it's even valuable to look at diversity, which might seem to have a very set definition, but thinking about it in the context of the particular work that we are doing, I think can be really important. Um, seen some example in like thinking like how higher ed thinks about diversity, stuff like that. So I, I definitely do see the value in that of having 
uh, grounding document to come back to as well. So I'm thinking that putting in words what we're thinking about so we can ground ourselves as well as kind of be transparent to the community about what we're doing. Um, I think something that, you know, council has been doing, um, at least this past year from what I've observed, but um, should continue to do and, and consider expanding on is, um, you know, just making sure that we're attending um, the public, um, the, the various events and celebrations around the city, not just the events that downtown with new ski holds, but um, things at the school, things at the senior center, things at the O'Brien Center, et cetera. Um, I think those those are areas where um, just having greater, like we have our own city calendar and links to the school calendar, but if um, if there are other events that, that we hear or know about that, um, that we can participate in, um, I know that there have been a couple um, block parties, um, for example, and, and just like encouraging more of those participating in those. Um, I, I think that that helps create additional trust and familiarity. Um, and is something that's doesn't put additional resources on staff or impacts the operational budget. Living with the uh, O'Brien Center directly behind me, I definitely see there seems to be some more community gatherings there. And I don't know if there would be a way to possibly get invites. I definitely wouldn't just want to show up. Sure. Um, of course. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. No, no, no. I, I understand. I, I was thinking for those in particular. Um, I, I think that that's, that's a really great point. Um, and some of that might be then making more connections that we can bring back into the community engagement too. I um one item that I would love to see, I mean, maybe this could come along with a development of a shared statement, but I think it would behoove us to look at some sort of auditing tool that we can easily and quickly apply to major policy decisions. For example, we had our discussion around eviction protections and um, general protections more broadly, like there could be some place for a somewhat um, I don't want to say objective, but a way for us to structure our thinking about how policy is intersect with equity. We don't really have that right now, right? We might have that conversation ad hoc in a given context. Like there are templates out there and we don't need to have something perfect, but we could have something that's uh, good enough for us to start more structuring our review policy because that's something that can last that outlast any individual counselor's training mm -hmm. and tenure on council. And I think that's, I mean, in all of these, I would love to see what we can have here that could potentially still be on the website if all of us were no longer on council as a thing that we do, right? As part of our policies and procedures, our standard operating procedure as council that we use these tools and certain steps uh, like in the community engagement plan or strategy and the you know, like a, a policy audit tool. So those are things that I think would be worth I would like to see us direct our efforts to some of those things that can be institutionalized beyond individuals. And that's an idea, that's one idea I have that seems to be um, could outlast us. I have collected several of those that I can bring to a future meeting at some point. I wonder too if that might be maybe use it use some of those templates, but I wonder if that might be even something that Elaine and I could bring to the folks at Ideal and see, is there a Vermont municipal specific one that could um, be generated? So we can definitely look into bringing yeah, that it's up. it's one of those things that VLCT is working on, but um, yeah, I think there is actually one used by the state, which a couple okay. of municipalities have adopted. So yeah, all of the above, all options. I do think it's one of those. There's there's likely to be little harm in adopting something imperfect at this yeah. point, um, and and potential gains, even if they're not fully as much as we could do, we can still make easy effort. And I think that's also important to not get hung up on waiting until we have a perfect, but to be able to make progress without harm, as you were saying, like.
The only other feedback I'll share is I, I feel compelled to say this because it has been weighing on me more over the past months is as a parent, it is ex it's hard to attend more events. Um, and I think that's something that for me, I would like to encourage us to think about what is a reasonable expectation of the counselor, especially if we want to have a council that represents the range of community members of the city, people with kids and people with kids of in ages between five and 18 are requiring a different type of work and commitment and, and attention. And I think that's something we gotta keep in mind um, that the, the ability to participate outside of these meetings is variable for folks in our community as we just discussed like Saturday morning being better uh, for some folks. And then um, for people who might consider running for council, I think we wanna make sure we're setting ourselves up to still be open for these positions to be um, accessible to as many people as possible in the community. I couldn't empathize harder with that, not as a parent, but like the volume of commitments that we make. And I have in the past, like, I don't know, approached it from a more selfish lens, more just like I am overcommitted, but you make a very good point, like as we, as we set up new structures, commissions, bodies, events we need to attend, who realists, is that shutting people out of, of, of doing public service? I think it's a good question to, to keep in mind. Um, I think there's uh, some clarification then that would be beneficial of like, an expectation versus something that does benefit and create more trust um, and correlates to creating and building more trust and familiarity. Like, I don't, I think it, it should be, um, capacity should be part of that conversation, of course. Um, and that attending events certainly is a way that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't um, hinder staff capacity or operational needs. Obviously, it, it factors into council needs, um, council capacity, I should say. So, um, I think that for me, that recommendation is like within within a counselor's capacity. Yeah, I just I, I think this goes into formalizing this community engagement strategy further, having more structure to it and having a bigger picture of what we are all doing or asking ourselves to do. And certainly some people have more time for certain things than others. Um, but yeah, having some visibility into that new council orientation, like here's sort of the, you know, we went through a list of, um, we did the liaison assignments, right? And then the airport commission came up and we created another commission um, so we just, we keep building on that and, and we should reflect on what the big picture is. One thing that, you know, I hate to bring up with the budget and this feels so far out of reach is, and is kind of awkward for a standing council to vote on is, but considering in future is compensating the council in a way that is more accessible to people because of the time commitment. Similar to talking about compensating um, our commissioners. I think that's something to acknowledge too, is this is it's a lot of work for little pay, and that uh, leaves out a huge part, it makes it very accessible to only certain members of the population who are able to do that. Which again, awkward, but well, I think it depends whether you view this as a paid position or a volunteer of the stipend. And I think that's I think that's a a discussion worth having, but I think to try and remunerate people for the actual hours spent in service would be it's, it's a different a model. And it's yeah. a it's a model that I don't know our community can support right now. No, no. I think that comes with it. Yeah. But I think it's can be good to acknowledge mm -hmm. that there is a cost barrier, even if it's not something that is super obvious to doing this work. I had one other note, but might tie a little bit to what Councilor Renner was bringing up too and thinking about ways to 
um, kind of continue our own learning and acknowledge that kind of all equity work um, requires kind of constant, no one's ever going to be an expert. We're always going to need to learn. And I wonder if there's a way to, and here's adding more work. So <laughs> um, how this might work, but adding a way to do something similar to what kind of staff leadership is doing and kind of uh, like have a rotating um, one counselor, maybe once a month brings in, I don't know if this would be in a meeting, but somehow brings forth a reading or an opportunity um, to kind of do more equity learning um, in some way. So just kind of building that into an expectation um, and also um, taking, hopefully again, putting that on the council instead of putting a burden on city staff. We're noting all of these ideas, right? We, we're not committing to anything yet. Of course. <laughs> then we'll have a follow-up conversation. I wondered if it could, um, in some ways, also intersect with our liaison appointments. Like if we could focus our, like our shared, uh, the learning that we try and share at back is some expertise we then develop in our commissions as well. Mm -hmm. Like I could see yeah. that, that there's like that, that co-benefit, right? Like it's not just the equity benefit, but also the benefit to the work. Yeah, um, that the commission or the council is trying to accomplish in the policy areas, um, and maybe helps bound it, not bound it, but like make it more um, like attackable because it's actually, like, what is the world of equity? I'm going to be council this month, and like yeah. I don't know because I'm not an expert. But if I talk about housing and equity, I feel like I could find some some hooks that I would find motivating to learn about and then share back. I think that could be a way to to structure that, oh, or, yeah. or an interesting way to to co structure that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with like planning and municipal infrastructure and economic vitality, those are areas where it's really interesting to explore how equity very much does intersect. Um, I think in ways that sometimes it's less less obvious than say say how we connect to people. Well, unless there are any other burning ideas, it's ten p.m. and we have an executive session. Can I have one more. Yes, <laughs> you can. It's just came to me, but maybe we add a goal update for council on a community engagement strategy. Um, we did kind of have benchmarks and goals listed in there that could be a, a monitoring, a standing monitoring item that we put ourselves to. Um, and even if the answer is well, we haven't done anything, it at least keeps us honest to that strategy. Because I do think you're right, Christine, Maya, that the, um, the engagement strategy provides some of these some of these structures that we might want already, and this could be a good way to monitor it. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Oh, well, last call for public comment. Any thoughts, questions? Ariel did try to raise her hand a couple oh, of times. I, and I didn't I see it. Always like in through the next comment, but I, I want to call it out specifically, Ariel. I know it's 10, but if you did have something. Okay, bring her over, Paul. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thanks. Um, I was just going to mention that I think Blaine and Tense at REIB in Burlington had made one of those policy audit tools that is being used um, for Burlington. It is pretty, anyways, you can ask her for um, a copy of it. And if you need her email, I'd be happy to share that. Um, but it sounded like you already had a collection of them there. So maybe you don't need them. Um, but I'll add, since I'm unmuted, that I appreciated having that hearing that conversation live in front of me. It's just, thank you for being candid um, and speaking about, about your equity goals and sharing that with the public. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mariel. I'll follow up because I would love another example, but. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is the end of our regular agenda. Uh, we've worn an executive session. Um, I'm looking for a motion to find that pursuant to state statute section 3131E uh, regarding civil litigation or prosecution. We should have this conversation in executive session so as not to put us, the city, at risk. So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Bryn. All those in favor, please say aye. 
I... I'm sorry, Aurora. <laughs> okay. It's 10 o'clock. <laughs> I'm losing it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, am I inviting just Elaine and Angela? I don't think oh, we need yeah. Angela. Oh, just you, Elaine. Yes. Oh, good for you, Angela. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm looking for a motion to move into executive session, inviting city manager Elaine Wong. So moved. Motion by Jim, second by Bryn this time. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, we have warned an action coming out of this executive session. So we'll move into executive session. We're only going to discuss this single topic. No other business will be discussed. When we come out of executive session, we may take a vote on, on the remaining action item to adopt a settlement resolution. Following that, the meeting will adjourn. We are on item 10A, on for discussion approval, adoption of the settlement resolution. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. This brings us to the end of the agenda. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Aurora. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Good night, everyone. <laughs>